Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's hearing. We're going to continue today hearing evidence from Mr. Peter Madison. So would you ask Mr. Madison to come in, please? Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Madison. Good morning. All ready to carry on? Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Millett. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Madison, good morning. Good morning. Um, we were, I think, on the topic of the discussions with Ryden in mid-March 2014 when we stopped on Thursday afternoon. Before we go back to that topic, can I just revisit with you a different topic, which we did uh, also look at last week, which was the question of sprinklers? And you'll recall the uh, exchange we had about that subject. Can I show you RBK 305771, please? Now, this is uh, the TMO's business plan, year two, from 2009 to 2014. And you can see that it bears the date of March 2010. Just in general terms, do you remember whether this was a document that you saw when you first joined the TMO in January 2013? I don't remember seeing it. You don't remember seeing it. Out. Right. Now, let's see if a particular part of it jogs a recollection. Can we go to page three, please? This is section one, introduction and, and background. Uh, and you can see the first two paragraphs. The 2009 TMO business plan sets out the aims, values, and strategic objectives for the period 2009 to 14 and builds upon our first plan, which was written in 2006 and updated during 2008. And then it says in the second paragraph, the TMO was set up in 1996 and the arm's length management organization, ALMO, was established in 2002. KC TMO manages 9,440 properties, of which 73%, 6,920 are tenanted, and 27%, 2,548 are leasehold dwellings. 98% of our properties are flats, of which 25% are in blocks of 10 storeys or more. 66% of the rented tenants rely on housing benefit, and 50% of rented households have a person with a long-term illness or disability living in the home. Half of tenants have their origins within the many black and minority ethnic BME communities that live in the Royal Borough. Now, can I just ask you, in general terms, were you aware when you joined the TMO of these statistics, or roughly these statistics? Um. I suppose roughly the statistics. Right. Yes. Um. Um, now, we discussed the question of sprinklers at day 57, pages 57 to 61. And I just want to ask you some general questions. Um, when the decision was made in 2013 not to retrofit sprinklers in general, uh, in the light of the recommendations made by the Lacknell House coroner, did the TMO, to your knowledge, take account of the high proportion of high-rise flats in the TMO's housing stock? Um, so I think there were, uh, there were a number of um, different conversations that were going on at that time in relation. So um, the, um, the head of health and safety within the TMO was in dialogue with the fire brigade about, um, about uh, potential works that would result from the Lacknell House inquiry. And um, there was a conversation that happened with the, with the uh, fire brigade regarding sprinklers. And I don't think that we'd have, there was ever a decision made, you know, it wasn't a decision made not to pursue sprinklers, it was something that was to, could and would be considered as part of an ongoing strategy. Um, but it, it was identified that it was a complex issue, both in terms of the practical issues of retrofitting sprinklers, but also in terms of the cost, uh, although the cost of the, the idea of um, uh, within our asset management strategy was to prioritise works that related to health and safety. Uh, when uh, you were considering this matter in 2013, uh, not to retrofit sprinklers for the reasons you've given, was any consideration given? So was account taken of the proportion of those with long-term illness or disability? Uh, within the housing stock? Um, not, I believe at that time, I think that would be something that um, 
would be considered in the, in, as part of the overall fire strategy in terms of fire risk assessment might take that into account or um, and we had a and um, also there was a high level health, health and safety rating system that was applied in terms of looking at health and safety risks in relation to uh, the asset management strategy. When the designs for the Grenfell Tower refurbishment were being considered, was any account taken of the profile of the residents so far as concerned their long-term illness or disability so that you, as the client, could assess the fire safety of the design? Um, I mean the, con the consultation that was um, undertaken with residents at, at Grenfell um, took into, into account people's individual requirements. Uh, so we, we had a dialogue with, with residents. Not, um, uh, so um, uh, yeah, uh, and also on the outs at the outset of the works, we um, worked with Ryden to visit all of the homes and talk to people about their specific mm -hmm. requirements and understand if, if there were any particular needs. In general, there was a um, our housing management department would also have uh, close liaison with residents and any particular needs uh, that they they had. Yeah. They were based on site. Do you recall either before your time from documents you saw when you arrived or during your time whether any specific instructions were given by the TMO either to Studio E or to Ryden to take into account the long term. Uh, illnesses or disabilities of those living within the tower when considering the design. Um, in terms of the implication, in terms of the, um, the, the the delivery of the works, we would talk to residents and understand if there were any particular needs that we could accommodate uh, through, throughout the works. Mm. But in, that's not really my question. My question was really a more general one. When when, when con uh, giving instructions so far as design was concerned, to Studio E or to Ryden, was any specific instruction given that they should, in general, take into account the long-term illness or disability profile of the residents when coming up with their designs? It would be something that we would consider as part of the consultation process that we put in place, which was about um, communicating to residents what we were proposing to do, inviting feedback, inviting residents to come and talk to us at drop-in sessions, visiting residents in their homes and taking account of any specific concerns that were raised throughout that process. And that was quite, that was an ongoing process that we, um, we managed throughout the, the project. Right. Well, we'll revisit that topic, I think, in greater detail at a later stage in this inquiry. For the time being, could you just tell me, was a DDA consultant ever appointed on the Grenfell Tower refurbishment? I don't know specifically. Um, it may have been there may have been a DDA consultant um, employed as part of the uh, design of the flats and the um, the work that was done. To uh, your sorry, to your knowledge, was a DDA consultant or the DDA consultant ever given any specific instructions to consider whether retrofitting of sprinklers would be necessary or appropriate for the building? I don't think it would have been a conversation regarding. Well, there may have been. I, I didn't have any direct contact with any. Uh, DDA consultant. Now, can we then go back to where we were on Thursday afternoon when we broke? Uh, and I want to go back to specifically to the 18th of March meeting. Uh, now, just to refresh your memory of the documents, um, can I show you please RYD 403302? This is an email from Steve Blake. Uh, on the 13th of March. Uh, and uh, it's, it's to Alan Sharrock, so it's internal. Uh, and I want just to show you the second email down, which that forwards on. And it's an email from Steve Blake to David Gibson at 18.30 on the 13th of March. Can you see the second email there? Yes. Uh, and in the third line, he says, as requested, we will respond early Monday regarding opportunities uh, for savings and timescales. So that's the response. And immediately above it, it says, your spreadsheet says a Tuesday PM meet rather than a Monday PM as, as email, which would work perfectly. And you can take it from me that the 18th of March 2014 was a Tuesday, Mr. Madison. Do you recall that there was a meeting on the 18th of March 2014 with Ryden? 
Um, I can't be sure of the date, but um, there was a meeting with Ryden regarding this, um, uh, this, this discussion we were having re regarding the approvals and um, that I was looking to develop for the board. And Claire Williams recalls that that meeting took place in the afternoon of that day. Do you recall I that? I don't recall. She also recalls that it took place at the TMO's offices. Do you recall that? I don't. You don't do you remember where it was? I don't. You don't. You were at that meeting, I think, yes. weren't you? Yes. And Claire Williams and David Gibson were also there, weren't they? They both said they were. You, you don't have any, do you have any reason? No, no reason to, to disagree with that. No. Right? And from Ryden, can you tell me who was there, please? I can't recall the meeting, I'm afraid. Was Steve Lake there? I can't recall, but it's likely he would be. Right. right. You recall nothing at all of the meeting? No, not specifically, no. Right. Um, well, let me see how far we go with this. Was the purpose of the meeting to discuss savings that could be made uh, over and above the, or below, as it were, the price that uh, Ryden had tendered at £9.2 million to, to close the gap? No, I think the, the purpose of this meeting was, so I think um, David Gibson, I'd asked David Gibson to put the meeting in as a backstop to, because uh, this was close to the deadline for the board report that I needed to put in place. So we needed to make this clarification as to whether we could agree the, in principle, the pre-contract agreement and um, the, the terms of that, and that would affect what I was going to report to my board. So this meeting was put in so that we could, um, it was a bit of a place saver really, to um, ensure that any issues that was need a clarification to allow my a report to my board uh, could be identified. Right. Uh, what was the date that you needed to put, what was the deadline for the board report that you needed to meet? And the board report was the 27th of March, and normally the deadline's a fortnight before, so it would probably be around right. this time. Had the date for the delivery of the board report, or the, the date for the board meeting, already been fixed? Yes. When was it fixed? It would be fixed at the start of the year, so we, you were, we, I was working to a, a fixed deadline schedule. Right, I see. You so said it was a fixed deadline. Mm -hmm. Was it possible to arrange things so that that deadline could be moved? Uh, not easily, no. And um, the board it, it had you know, there, was, there was quite a large number of people involved in the board, and the, the the meetings were scheduled throughout the year. If I didn't get the report approval to that meeting, they, they met every six weeks, I think. So it would have meant six weeks of, of delay if we, if I didn't get to that board meeting. So in your mind, this was a hard deadline. Yes, the twenty sixth of March. 27th. The, meet, uh, the 27th of March, I think, was the meeting and mm. you needed to deliver the report the night before. No, a fortnight before. A fortnight before. So what was the, what was the date, the delivery, de the deadline for the report? I can't remember off, off, my hand, off the top of my head, but it would be, a, it, yeah, I think, um, from memory, this meeting was put in close to that deadline, so if any clarification was needed at that time, um, I could have that conversation or we could make that clarification. Right. I mean, the fortnight before the TMO board meeting, if it, were, if it was fixed for the 27th of March, would have been the 13th of March. Um, As a matter of calendar mathematics, that mm, must be right. Maybe I'm getting, maybe I'm getting my dates wrong. Maybe, it's a, maybe it was a week before. I, I, I don't really remember. Right. Okay. The, the, the dead, so I think... Um, I can't remember the, the, the exact dates here, but um, the schedule, the, the process that a board report would go through is I would submit a board a draft of it to the executive team, and the executive team would review it, and I would present it to the executive team first, and then it would go on to, to the board, so there would be an agenda review at executive team. So those um, dates will be minuted throughout. Yes. I mean, you say the meeting was a place saver, but in fact, uh, it was the occasion, wasn't it, when five days after the 13th of March email we can see on page one, this question, the discussion of the spreadsheet and the reduction of the price to close the gap to 800,000 less w was going to take place, wasn't it? Well, that wasn't the purpose of the discussion. So the, the, the reduction to the gap wasn't the, the 800,000 was 
that wasn't a negotiation reduction of the gap. That was partly a mixture of things. It was partly the application of alternate options within the tender. So windows and cladding, there were, alter there were alternative, mater alternative materials, two different materials priced within the, 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 the bill of quantities or the, the specification for the, um, uh, the tender, plus the windows needed a um, planning application to, uh, to be um, uh, to be followed through and completed to confirm the firm of those costs. There also needed to be some work done relating to some of the works that were included in the tender that had also been included in the CALC project. So we need to establish the cost of those items and if the planning permission for the ACM cladding wasn't successful and as in alternative was, was given, then we would have to review the budget at that point. My, my question was a slightly different one. You suggested that the 18th of March meeting was fixed as a place saver or placeholder. <clears throat> in fact, looking at th this email and looking at what happened, there wasn't going to be any dis detailed discussion or indeed any discussion between the 13th of March and the 18th of March. What I'm putting to you is the 18th of March was the occasion on which discussion should happen. It wasn't just a place saver. No, I don't agree. Um, the, meet, the, the work that was required on this had been done in, a, in the dialogue between David Gibson and Steve Blake and his team um, in, the, in the period between the 13th of March and the, and the meeting. And actually at the meeting it was, there was very little required because we clarified the points that were, were needed, which were, about, which were the things that were written into the terms of the pre-contract agreement with Ryden. Are you aware of any notes or minutes that were taken of that meeting? No. You took no notes? No. And it's right that t the TMO kept minutes of most formal meetings, didn't it? This wasn't a formal meeting as part of the structure of the contract. This was a, an, off, uh, an offline conversation to establish principles, to allow a board report to be written, which would um, facilitate a way forward through the formal process. Yeah. Um, you say an offline meeting. What do you mean by that? Oh, well, that's the words that were used in the, um, the the conversation between Simon Cash and Jenny Jackson. And it was because this wasn't part of the formal process. This was a an informal conversation with the with the preferred contractor at that stage to clarify the principles, which are the ones that I've described about working up the detail of the planning permission and therefore the costs, but also to establish the principle that post tender. Ryden would work with us to, 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 to value engineer under the terms of that contract uh, a figure of about £270,000. It was quite an important meeting, wasn't it? it? It wasn't a contractual meeting. It was an important meeting in terms of establishing principles and in, and in terms of allowing me to get the approval that was needed through, through the governance of the TMO. But it wasn't, a, it wasn't a meeting, it wasn't a negotiation meeting, it was about establishing those principles. Mm. It was about establishing those principles. Can you explain, in the light of the purpose of the meeting, why there are no notes or minutes of this meeting kept by any of the attendees? Um, I think because all of the work had been done before the meeting and there was actually nothing required to be noted or, or agreed at that meeting. It was all, we'd got the information we needed, which was the principles about... Um, the costs and the, pro and the process for a pre-contract agreement, which was the, what really what this dialogue was all about establishing. Is not the true explanation for the absence of a single written record of this meeting that it was supposed to be a secret meeting? It wasn't a secret meeting. I mean, we'd, we'd, there's clearly written correspondence between the two parties who were at the meeting. I've also written, I, I, I briefed my, uh, the executive team at the TMO on this. Um, and I think that was minuted in the executive team minutes when I presented the draft report and explained that this is what we were doing. And I, I, that those minutes explained that I'd met with the, the preferred contractor to discuss and progress these issues. So I was completely transparent about what was happening. I did flag up that there was potentially some risk in terms of challenge from, uh, 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 but uh, we took advice on that. Yes, we'll come to that shortly. Uh, I'm going to suggest to you that the reason why no note of the meeting was taken was because it was secret and had to be secret because it was a unilateral discussion with only one of the three bidders in the tender. 
So the advice that we had from Trowers at the, at the point of the tender being received was that there was no way of having um, a dialogue with the three contractors. The only way forward was to either uh, move forward with the preferred contractor or go back out and re-procure. So there was no option to do that. What we did recognise was that there was some risk of challenge through the, the single dialogue with the preferred contractor, and we took advice on that. And um, uh, yeah, before we proceed, yeah, uh, the reality is that this was a a breach of the procurement rules, or put it this way, put the TMO in significant risk of a breach of the of the procurement rules, and you knew that. I think there was a risk of challenge. And that's a commercial risk, and that was something to be considered as part of, uh, of the way forward. We had a situation here where we had a project that had been in progress to this point for a couple of years. Residents had high expectations of the works being carried out, and there had been a significant uh, number of delays. The procurement of this... Um, there, was a, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a very strong field in terms of the people who, um, well, there, there weren't, in terms of number, there wasn't a lot of interest in, the, in this project because the, the market at that time was, was quite active. And um, the risk here of going out to re-procure was that we may get even less interest uh, because the people who've already expressed an interest may not bid, but also there's more delay and potentially more cost because you'd be getting the cost of building cost inflation as well. So we really felt that um, th at this stage, we felt it was really important to at least explore the option of uh, the preferred bidder. And then this wasn't a definitive decision because it, at the end of that pre-commencement agreement, there would still may potentially be the option of deciding to go out and re-procure. Yes, it's a long answer to what I'd hoped was a simple question, but, but there it is. Um, the, the, the risk assessment exercise that you've just shared with us, was that something that you actually discussed with anybody within the TMA before this meeting? It, there was a discussion between... Um, so I discussed this with Jenny Jackson, our procurement uh, specialist, and she'd had a dialogue with um, Simon Cash from Artelia, so, that, so that, because we knew there was a there was a challenge here to be overcome, and um, I briefed the executive team on um, this this approach right. uh, before the board report, and um, in the minutes <coughs> it, uh, that was reflected in the minutes. So there was nothing secret about this. This was a this was a, dis a discussion that carried some risk, um, some commercial risk, um, but we felt it was the right thing to do on balance. Mm. The risk, let's just analyse for the moment, the risk you were running was, was the risk of these secret discussions with Ryden becoming known by the other bidders, wasn't it? Because it is that which would have led to a challenge. Um, well, it wasn't a secret meeting. It was, it was a meeting with the, with the preferred contractor. Yes, um, of which no notes were taken... And I, I, I'm bound to suggest to you that the real risk, the heart of the risk here, was the risk of being caught, because that would lead to a challenge and a likely re-procurement. We took advice from this. At, at the beginning of, the, of this dialogue with the preferred bidder, we spoke to Trowers, and then at the end of the process, we got further advice from Trowers, and they summarised the risk as being there but small, uh, and they because in, 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 the, in essence, what we were doing was activating some of the alternative material prices within the tender, and that, in reality, would have made the gap between the preferred bidder and the second-place contractor is even bigger. So they, they felt that the risk of challenge was, was, was small. There was, there was a commercial risk there, but, we've, you know, the, but the urgency here was to try and get the project onto site. When you say there was a commercial risk there... Was there not, I mean, the, the commercial risk for the TMO was that it would become exposed to a claim for damages from a, from a challenger or perhaps two challengers? It could be a loss of profit, but they would have to demonstrate that there was a loss of profit. And as they were so far apart, from, so far from being in a position to have actually been the preferred bidder in this, both on price and on quality, that seemed a very, very relatively insignificant risk. And you, that's, would, you wouldn't know that, of course, unless you'd had the same sorts of discussions 
with them that you were proposing to have and indeed did have with Ryden? Well, we weren't allowed to. We got very clear advice from that that that, you can't, that can't be done. And there was also a risk, wasn't there, for the TMO of reputational damage, playing fast and loose or sailing close to the wind with the EU procurement rules. I don't think it's considered. playing fast and loose. I think it's about trying to work within uh, the rules and assessing risks as appropriate. The OG, uh, the OG rules are complex and things move within a quite extended time of process of the procurement. And I, think, I don't think it's uncommon for clients to have to weigh up these sort of risks um, in, in a process that can, that can be challenging. What led you to think that risk was worth taking? I, I think I've described that in terms of, um, I think that the risk would have been further delay further dissatisfaction from residents about the works not being carried out, and that was our primary concern here. But also, we were in a, um, a rising market at that time. It was difficult to attract contractors because there was a lot of work about, and costs were rising. So we would have attracted more cost in terms of um, building cost inflation, and we wanted to, you know, and it appeared that we had a viable uh, and an affordable um, scheme here based on the tender process that we'd run. How, oh, well, not how necessarily, did you think at the time, Mr. Madison, that a challenge by uh, the other two bidders, or even just one of them, might affect your relationship with the residents in the tower? Sorry, I don't really understand that. Well, did you think at the time how a challenge, if a challenge was to be made, would affect the TMO's relationship with the residents in Grenfell Tower? Sorry, I don't make that connection. Well, you may not now. Did you make the connection then? I'm not sure I'm understanding the question at all. Did you think at the time, along the following lines, if our meeting with Ryden gets out and there's a challenge by one of the other bidders, how would that look to the residents of the building? Did, um, you, th did you have thoughts along those lines at the time? I didn't, but if, I, if, if, that, if that eventuality had emerged, I would have explained to residents why we'd done what we'd done, and we tried to have as open a dialogue as, as, as possible. Does it come to this, really, that retender was just a no-no in your mind? It wasn't the no-no. It was an option that was always there. But it wasn't the, uh, it was what, what I wanted to do, what I felt that we should do, is try and see whether we can um, engineer the, um, the, the successful um, uh, preferred contractor and try and see whether we can make that work. That would work both in terms of starting on site and getting the works done in the, in the most time effective way, but also mitigating the risk of further. Um, inflation on the project, but also the fact that we hadn't had a good response or a very, very large response from the uh, from a European-wide uh, pre-qualification pre process. So it didn't feel like there were loads of contractors out there. And obviously, if they've been through one process unsuccessfully, those contractors probably wouldn't bid a second time. So there was a real danger that you put it out to the market and you might not have anybody there at all who was expressing an interest. And the real priority here was to make sure that we got a contractor with the right experience who'd done this sort of work, and that was, that was one of the overriding things. And in this case, we seem to have that. You see, one of the reasons, as we, I think, established last week, and tell me if this isn't correct, was that one, one of the reasons for the re-procurement uh, was uh, that Leadbitter were persistently too expensive. And the idea of going through a re-procurement exercise was essentially to go back to the market. Now, the market had come in at £800,000 at, at minimum above your budget. Did that not tell you uh, that there was something wrong with your budget as against the scope of the works that you wanted? And we were open to reviewing the budget. In fact, we did review the budget but in, in June um, once we'd carried out the pre-contract works and established the true scope. We increased the budget at that stage. Uh, in terms of the Leadbetter work, I don't agree. Uh, with, with your summary. Um, what, the reason that we didn't proceed with Leadbetter was that they were, the, was the process that they'd gone through in, term, in this, the long and drawn out process of trying to get the costs broken down so that we could understand the difference between our Tellier's estimates and Leadbetter's costs, but also their lack of direct experience of managing a project like this with residents and occupation.
why not simply just reduce the scope of the, the works for the refurbishment and go out to tender again and make sure that your budget fitted what the market could bear? Because that would, of course, delay. And, and, and for the reasons I've described, um, we may not have had... You know, the market would have been depleted because we'd already invited people to go through an extensive process. And uh, why would they bid again? Now, let's go to your day book or notebook. Right, before we do, can I just ask you to just deal with this squarely? You say you recognise that there was a risk of a challenge. Would we be right to understand that you recognise that that risk of challenge arose from the fact that you were uh, in breach of the OJU procedure by talking to one contractor? Um, it was... It was... It was, I wouldn't say in breach, I would say it didn't strictly comply with the letter of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the process. And, right. and I think this is, a, you know, so we did recognise there was a risk of doing this, but felt that it was commercially the thing to, to do. All right, thank you. Yes, Mr Millett? Yes. Well, we'll come back to that answer shortly when we look at the trial's advice, if we may. But can I just stick with the contemporaneous record for the moment? Can we look at your... Uh, notebook, please, which I believe is notebook number five, TMO 00879778. And at page... Uh, if we can go to page three of that, please, at the, uh, at the top. Uh, we can see an entry for the 17th of March, 2014. You see that? Yeah. And that's about an HRA meeting... Just note the date of that, if you would. And if we go to page four, uh, we go to uh, the next entry, which uh, says on the left-hand side of the page, and I'm afraid it's come up a um, long ways up, but it says Grenfell Ryden. You see that? DG to arrange... Thank you. DG to arrange meeting with Studio E and planners subsequently... And then it says KCTMO in a circle. And then if we can switch it back to uh, uh, landscape, um, it says Telecon 19th of March. Do you see that on the right-hand side of the page? Uh, 19th of March. You see the date? Yes, yes. Can we infer that the second page occurred between the 17th of March and the 19th of March? In other words, I've taken you between the 17th and the 19th of March, and we see everything in there that happened according to your own note. There's nothing in there for the 18th of March. I don't know. And looking at the top of page four, well, we could see, well, would you accept this? There's nothing in here on the, any of the pages I've shown you which comprises a note of the meeting of the 18th of March, or indeed anything which points to that meeting even taking place. Um. I don't know. Well, I'm asking you, this is your contemporaneous note, would you accept that there's nothing in this notebook which even hints at a meeting either was to take place or had taken place on the 18th of March? I think it's... It's possible that the the note on the left hand side there is is from the the meeting with Rydens. What well, David Gibson to arrange meeting with Studio E and planners subsequently. What's that got to do with the meeting that took place on the eighteenth of March? So far as we know, what happened at it? I would assume that's a potential action from that meeting. Right. Are you assuming that? Well, as I say, I don't think that, you know, I think the work had been done yeah. between all both parties before the meeting, and I think the meeting had very little to do. Right. Would you take it from me, looking at this document, that there's nothing in it which indicates that an, a, a meeting on the 18th of March with Ryden to discuss value engineering either was to take place or did take place? I'm just, I, I suspect that the, the note on the left-hand side of the page is the note of those meetings. I haven't, I haven't written a date but if it's, that, seems, that seems reasonable. To Can assume. you account for the fact that you yourself took no detailed notes of what was discussed at that meeting? I think what was discussed at that meeting had been 
agreed in correspondence, or the principles have been set out in the correspondence between David Gibson and Ryden? You see, Mr. Madison, our sight of your diaries and your notebooks indicates that you are a, a thorough and quite prolific taker of notes about what was happening on the Grenfell Tower project and indeed other things within your remit. There is a yawning gap for the 18th of March. I wonder why that is. I don't agree that I'm a pr prolific taker of notes. Uh, what I do is I note action points from meetings. So most of, the, most of the things I've got here are action points or aid memoirs for me to do something in the, in the future. So I don't keep verbatim notes. I just keep a note of actions. So if there are no actions, there will be no notes. Why is there no action for you to set up meeting or go to meeting on the 18th of March? Sorry, I don't understand. Why is there no action note for you to set up a meeting or go to a meeting on the 18th of March? Well, that would be... I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not... I'm not well, I wouldn't note, not necessarily note that. It would either be noted in my diary, either my, possibly my electronic diary, um, and because that was, that was the, in, in reality, all of my appointments were put in the electronic diary. My paper diaries were remembering to follow up. They were an aid memoir to follow up on, on, on specifics. I suspect this meeting on the left, this on the left hand side is the, the meeting that we put as a backstop meeting for Ryden, and that that is the only action that has come out of it, which is for David Gibson to arrange a meeting with Studio E. You see your diary, or the, well, this notebook, uh, contains all kinds of things. For example, on the right-hand side, set up meeting. What, what I'm really putting to you is, or asking you about, is why there is complete silence about the, even the existence of the meeting with Ryden on the 18th of March. I think if, if I'd put the date, the 18th of March, on the left-hand page there, that would have been the... I and mean, I don't know what was on the previous page. Well, I showed you the previous page. We can go back but, to it if you but like. But this meeting, you, you're implying this meeting was secret. It isn't. It's minuted in the executive team uh, meeting. Subsequently, I explained the dialogue is happening. This wasn't improper. This was about understanding principles that I could write into a pre-contract agreement. And that's exactly what we've done. And I've been absolutely transparent about that. We'll come to that later. Uh, on the right-hand side, it says under Telecom, 19th of March, T and H. What was that a reference to? Trous and Hamlin. Now, before I ask the following questions, I just want to give you a fair warning that I'm not asking you about the content of any legal advice. That isn't mine to ask. And unless somebody tells you otherwise, it isn't yours to answer, just to be clear. But T and H is Trous and Hamlin's. Uh, and it, it, it says in writing there, advice agreement something, like I'm afraid I can't read it, rides to keep negotiating and contract price confidential. Are you able to help us with what that says or means? I think this would, this relates to the advice that they subsequently give in relation to the process that we went through post, um, post tender and pre-contract. Um, the date is of course, after the date on which Ryden had been notified that they were the preferred bidder, wasn't it? I don't know the date of that. But we'll, we'll, we'll come you. to that. Do you remember the discussion with Trous and Hamlin's on the 19th of March, of which this is a record? I clearly briefed Trous and Hamlin and took advice, and there's written response on that. I don't remember the exact date, but that looks like a, a, I've had the telephone conversation with Trous and Hamlin. Right. That point. What does it say after the word agreement? With. With. And rides is Ryden, I assume. Yeah. Right. Uh, did Ryden agree to make savings at the meeting? No. What did they agree? They the agreed to work with us on the basis of the pre-contract agreement that was the points of which were written into the board report that I presented to the board and agreed with the board on the 27th of March. Can we go to ART 408632, please? This is the letter notifying Ryden that, that it is the preferred bidder. 
And you can see the date at the top, 18th of March 2014. And I'll just show you a little bit of detail about it. Uh, if you look at the uh, addressee, it's Peter Arnold at Ryden. And the title of the letter is Notice of Preferred Bidder Status, Enhancement and Improvements to Grenfell Tower for Kensington and Chelsea T Tenant Management Organisation. And then it says in large, bold caps, <coughs> subject to agreement of boundary adjustments and formal approval from the Board of Directors of KCTMO and the Council. And I'll just read you the first paragraph so you've got it firmly in your mind. I would like formally to thank you for your tender for the enhancements and improvements to Grenfell Tower contract. We have now concluded the tender evaluation process and we have been authorised by the Kensington and Chelsea TMO, KCTMO, as employer's agent for the above mentioned project to inform you that you are the preferred bidder and it is the intention of KCTMO to enter into contract with you subject to the agreement of the site boundary and formal approval from the KCTMO board and the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea Council, RBKC. Uh, and then uh, it um, goes on about the uh, arrangements. Uh, uh, and it says in the penultimate paragraph, if you look at that, KCTMA believes that its procurement arrangements are robust, fair and transparent. If, however, during the standstill period, legal proceedings are commenced against KCTMO to challenge the proposed contract award, we cannot progress beyond this letter until those proceedings are resolved. Uh, and then in the last paragraph, it says, at the end of the above mentioned standstill period, we shall enter into discussions with you regarding the site boundary issue should a satisfactory agreement be reached and subject to the approval of KCTMO and RBKC, the contract will be awarded to you. And then if you turn the page, please, it's signed by Phil Booth uh, at Artelia. Now, we can see, as I've shown you, that there is mention here of really two issues. First of all, the site boundary and secondly, the approval of the board, and indeed our BKC, as it seems. There's no mention in this letter anywhere of the 18th of March meeting, was there? No. And there's no me mention in this letter of any uh, discussions, either past, present, or prospective, about value engineering, is there? Um, well, they were written into the contract. Uh, Those provisions are written into the contract. The contract being what? The contract that would be awarded, so it was written into the employee's requirements? That They weren't, in fact, formalised until the end of October 2014, were they? Uh, I don't remember the date. Right. Certainly, there's no reference to agreeing to a value engineering process, let alone a reduction from 9.2 million in this letter, as a condition of the award, is there? It's not a condition of the award, it's a, it's a factor of the contract. And it wasn't even a factor of the contract uh, that there should be any movement at all from Ryden, down from 9.2 million, is there? Um, that's why we took advice on this. But, but it's, if, at this stage, we, there hadn't been any negotiation, so therefore we couldn't, re, we couldn't um, they wouldn't be reflected in, the, this, in this award. There's no mention in this letter that the, the award of the contract, when it came, as opposed to notification of winning status, was in any way conditional upon an agreed value engineering. That's not my understanding. Well, where is it in the letter? It's not in the letter, no. it's in the contract. It's not in the letter. Why was there no reference in the letter to a condition that they would get the contract only if they were to agree a value engineered new lower price. It, it wasn't only if. So the principle that we were establishing here was to say to the contractor that there were certain elements that needed to be clarified in terms of materials, planning, boundaries in the interface with the Calc project, for example, and the pre entry into a, and so at this at this stage we were entering into a pre contract agreement that would allow us to um, quantify and evaluate those issues, at which point we can make a decision to either award the contract or go back out to tender. So this, at this stage, we were entering into a pre-contract phase where we could clarify these issues, and that's what we did. There's no reference in the award letter to making it a condition 
that you would enter into a pre-contract on satisfactory terms as to value engineering, is there? Um, I don't know. Well, there isn't, is there? I don't know. Well, it's not in the letter, is it? it You've got to read mean... the letter in full and, and then answer my question. I don't. I didn't write the letter. This was Atelier's letter to. Um, so they've, they're acting as our agents on this. So they've written this letter. So what I was, but what we had done before, in relation to this, was to agree the principles of a pre-contract agreement, and that's what we were doing. Yes, you've explained that. I just want to. Do you give instructions to Artelia to send this letter? No. Do you know who did? No. Do you know how it came about that Artelia thought it? It was, it was the letter ready to go when they sent it? No. You can't help us with who it was who told Artelia to send the letter in its final form? I don't. Can we look at another notice? ART 402224. This one is to Malali, one of the other bidders who were unsuccessful. Uh, and um, is this a letter you've seen before, do you think? No. Do you know who authorised Artelia to send this letter? No. Uh, take it from me that there's no reference in this letter to any discussions that Ryden was having about reducing its price, either as a matter of general approach or general understanding. Why is that? This was a notification of the outcome of the process that um, Mullally uh, had been involved in to that point, and it was... Uh, flagging up that process, and um, it's, a, it's a standard part of the OG process. Mm. Yes. I take it that you never, and no one else at the TMO, ever sought to have the same sort of discussions that you were having with Ryden, uh, with Mullally. Would that be right? It was quite clear in the advice from Trowers that that wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, can we go to ART 408755? This is the email sent by Peter Blythe of Artelia to Peter Arnold at Ryden at 5.55 p.m. You see that? On the evening of the 18th of March, 2014. And the subject is Grenfell Tower notice of tender result. And the uh, attachment is a, a, a letter. And we can see that uh, Claire Williams is copied, as is Jenny Jackson. You're not copied in on this. Um, and it says, Dear Peter, please find attached the notice of tender result for the works at Grenfell Tower. Um, it appears from the timing of this email that Ryden were notified that they were the preferred bidder only after the meeting that the TMO had with Ryden that day about value engineering their price. Is that right? Um. I don't know that the two are linked, but um, I can see that it's on the same day. Well, you say that you don't know that the two are linked. Just in general terms, uh, why did the letter telling Ryden that they were the preferred bidder not go before the 18th of March? I don't know. Is it possibly because it, it, you, the TMO, uh, could not decide to tell Ryden that they were the winner until you'd had the meeting that you did have on the 18th of March? I don't recall. You don't recall? Was the selection of Ryden held back until the TMO was sure that Ryden would reduce their price? This wasn't about reducing price. This was about agreeing a process. This wasn't about reducing the price. Well, if it wasn't about reducing the price, what was it about? It was about agreeing the process for a pre-contract agreement that would allow us to, uh, to clarify price and at which point we could make a decision about whether to proceed or whether to go back out to tender. When you say it was about process as opposed to price which is the opposition I think you're inviting the chairman to draw. Can you explain what you mean by process? So the process here was that we needed to get a, an approval from, a, uh, from board because of the value of the works. Uh, we also needed to get approval from the cabinet and the council because of the joint funded nature of the, of the project. Um, so in order to move this forward, what we um, needed to do was to clarify a process that could, be, could keep the process moving um, and clarify price, and it, which once we've got a clarity about that price, we could then enter into contract. So that's why we entered into a pre-contract agreement with Rydens to progress the development of um, the planning permission and therefore, and consequently, the cost of significant aspects, but also the um, interface of the project 
with the neighbouring CALC project, which had some significant challenges. And so there were two pieces of work that needed to be clarified. And they were written into the board report that was presented to the board on the 27th of March. Are you telling us that there was no discussion at all at the 18th of March meeting about specific figures? The figures, as, as we saw last week, was the, there was a, a schedule of figures to give some context as to the sort of scale and the sort of issues that we were looking for. The majority of those were already priced within the, 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 the Ryden's tender. There was £270,000 further saving that we wanted to understand in principle whether Ryden's thought they could work with us post-contract to, uh, to, uh, to or, or we could, or alternatively, we could increase the budget. And in reality, we ended up increase, increasing the budget. So there was some <coughs> discussion at the meeting of the schedule of figures, the David Gibson simple spreadsheet we looked at last week. I don't recall there being one at the meeting. I think the dialogue had happened in the exchange of emails in, in between. At the meeting, do you remember looking documents with figures on them. I don't. Now, Mr Blake said in his oral evidence that to write and gave no assurances at the meeting of the 18th of March. Do you agree with him? I don't remember the meeting, to be honest. Um, I can see the, the exchange between the two parties. I can remember having a, a meeting in, in the diary because I knew there was a deadline. That I needed to a very tight deadline to get this um, this report to our board and get the process moving. And, um, and that's, that's, that's what I recall. Now, you said this morning a number of times, and you also said it on Thursday, and just for uh, your note, well, actually, I'll take you to it. Um, but you said that uh, the TMO had taken legal advice. Uh, uh, let's look at day 58, page 201, please. You said it also this morning a number of times, but it's simpler just to show you what you said th on Thursday. And at page 201, I'd like you to go to line 19. And the question was, did you think at the time that by telling Ryden that their price was in first place and their presentation and documentation was in first place was improper in the sense that it wasn't compliant with the rules on public procurement for public works? Answer, I wouldn't call it improper. I would say that it did factor in some potential risks of challenge within, you just go over the page, please, EU procurement rules. However, we took legal advice on that. The advice was not that it was illegal or improper. It advised us that there were particular risks, and those are commercial risks that we might want to consider in order, in the situation that we found ourselves in. I just want to have that in your mind very firmly when I show you what I'm going to show you next. But before I do, can I ask you, whose idea was it, do you recall, to take legal advice on EU procurement rules? Um, there was a, I think, Jenny Jackson, and um, there was a dialogue between Jenny Jackson and Artelia on this matter, and I think Jenny Jackson got some initial advice uh, from Trous and Hamlin. I see. And I took advice later uh, in relation to the, the approach that was being proposed in the board report. I see. So do I take it from that that you weren't involved in the initial decision to instruct Trowers and Hamlins? I probably was, had a conversation with Jenny Jackson, I would imagine. Do you remember what she said to you? Um, I remember having a conversation very much along the lines of, um, of what I've described in terms of... Um, well, 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 no, let's see if we can do a bit better. Do you remember whether she came to you and said, I think we need to take legal advice, or did you tell her that you thought you needed to take legal advice? I can't remember. But Jenny was a very competent and very experienced procurement person, and uh, I would have trusted her to get the appropriate advice. D did you play any part in the giving of the instructions to Trowers and Hamlins? Not that I remember now. Right. Not, not the, first, the first one. I did the second. Do you remember wh what it was that you thought, it, you thought necessitated the taking of legal advice? Which one, the first or the second? Well, early, let's, let's start with the, what you've called the first. So we had a um, early, when the tenders were issued for the project, uh, we hadn't been issued a pre-tender estimate at that stage. And bearing in mind that this contract included works that were included in the CALC project, so that would have inflated the price. So, so we, but we recognised that there was potentially a gap between 
the, the value of works that have been put out and the, the current available budget. And so the professional team did some work to scope out um, those the, 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 to scope out those uh, areas of potential saving within the, the scope of works. And um, so I think as part of that, uh, to, you know, I think the team and, and Jenny in particular would have been aware that we were going to have to consider our options when the tenders arrived. I see. So you, you think that it was Jenny's identification of the gap you've just identified, which meant that you had to take legal advice? Yes, because we had a gap between the budget and our, our options are either to increase the budget or to work with, it, with the preferred contractor in contract to, um, to, to value engineering the scheme closer to the budget. But also there were elements within the scheme that hadn't we didn't have fixed price for because the planning permission had not been, the conditions haven't been uh, met yet. Yes, I understand. Can we then go to ART 406433, please? This is an email chain on the 2nd and 3rd of March 2014. This is about a week or so before uh, the, uh, well, five days or so before perhaps, the uh, tender interviews. So the, the tender process, just for chronology's sake, was still continuing. Uh, now, you're not copied in on these emails, but uh, uh, David Gibson and Claire Williams are. And uh, if I go to the second page, please, in that email run, we can see that here is an email from Jenny Jackson, dated the 2nd of March 2014, to Phil Booth, Simon Cash, Claire Williams, and Peter Blythe, copied to David Gibson. Now, you're not copied in. So let's see how we go. But just looking at it, do you think it's an email that you saw at the time? No, I don't think so. Well, let's, let's look at it. Uh, it says, um, please can we discuss how we intend to bridge the gap between the 9.249294 tender submitted and the 8.5 million client budget? Now, just pausing there, the 9.2 odd million pound tender is the right and tender, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So the gap that uh, the subject of her focus at this time is the, the gap between the right and tender and the £8.5 million pound client budget, not anybody else's gap. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the advice obtained from Trials and Hamlins is clear, and I'll just show it to you. KCTMO has advertised the contract as a restricted procedure based on an estimated contract value of £8 million to £10 million. Pounds. Tenderers are required to submit a price for undertaking the programme, and KCTMO is required to assess the tenders based on the price stroke quality criteria you have set out in the tender documents. The restricted procedure does not permit a contracting authority to undertake negotiations with the tenderers prior to contract award and does not provide for the contracting authority to revise the tender document or, to, or for tenderers to submit revised best and final offers. To do so would be a breach of the EU regulations, even if you allowed all the tenderers to renegotiate their prices. Your only EU compliant options are to assess the tenders and award the contract to the tender, tenderer who scored the highest based on your price stroke quality criteria, or not to award the contract and run a new procurement exercise. If the contract allows it, you may run value engineering exercises with your selected tenderer, but only once the contract has been entered into. You see that? Yes. Uh, and. Uh, We'll come to the last paragraph of her own email, which is her opinion, Jenny, as Jenny Jackson's opinion in a moment. Was it, just looking at the first paragraph, the gap between the Ryden bid and the client budget, was, just looking at that, something that told us that it was a foregone conclusion that if the contract was to be awarded at all, it would go to Ryden as the lowest bidder. I think it's not as the lowest bidder. I think as part of the, the appropriate price quality evaluation that was uh, model that was put there. That was the only option right. in this process. That's what the advice is. Do, do you know what the point of having the interviews would have been in those circumstances? The interviews was part was a, was was the final part of a 
a quality submission. So the quality submission scored a, out of scored each contractor out of a hundred, hmm. and the tender process was the sorry the the interview uh, pro, uh, process was a, the final part of that. And it was a five percent score. A, a key part of that, uh, the, the reason for that was to. Um, engage with stakeholders and we particularly wanted residents to be involved in those interviews and give them the opportunity to meet potential contractors um, and in the event uh, we ended up with a resident board member and a local ward councillor attending those interviews and we needed to complete that as part of that quality evaluation. I mean at this point is it fair to say that it was Ryden or nothing? At that point Ryden we'd had an interim report from uh, Artelia, I remember, and um, so irrespective of the outcome of the scoring of the uh, the interview, Ryden were going to be in first place, even if they'd scored nothing and the others had scored full marks. Mm. Jenny Jackson was particularly wary of interviews because of the unwritten nature of them, and uh, she felt that... Uh, for transparency's sake, it was much safer to keep as much in, in written form than uh, rather than in um, meeting form. What were the residents who had formed part uh, or were to form part of the interview process have had to come up with in order uh, to get the TMO to think about somebody other than Ryden? Well, the, um, I mean, the OGU process doesn't really allow. A great deal of choice. It's a very clear and open process that you need to need, that needs to be followed. So we put an open advert out. People apply, and there are various ad, um, various um, uh, evaluations. So uh, I mean, I I wasn't part of this process, save for the very last part of the the, the interview, um, and I, but. Um, but I read the tender report that explained quite what had been evaluated through that process. And it, looked, it was about looking at the price, not just in terms of the actual cost, but in terms of its variance, in terms of uh, the various yeah. elements that have been priced within it. And it looked at experience and a, and a wide, wide range of, yeah. of other issues. I'm just trying to get a feel for what it would be that the residents would have to say at the interviews or tell you after the interviews that would make all the difference. Well, n nobody can make that, different, that, that decision. I mean, the option is to run through the process that's been defined at the very outset and evaluate an award on that basis or start again on a different basis. Now, let's so look at the process wasn't about giving a choice to say, I like this one and not that one. It was about being part of that process and seeing. And obviously, if people had concerns, we would look at trying to address those concerns. Now, let's look at the s second paragraph. Uh, she, Jenny Jackson, says the advice obtained from Trowers and Hamlins is clear. Now, you weren't copied in on this email chain at the time, but did you know the gist of this advice at this point? Yes, so, I remember having a conversation with Jenny Jackson about it. And was there anything about the advice that you didn't understand at that uh, time? No. Now, your discussions with Ryden about reductions from their bid price, or even just about process, as you, as you put it, before the contract was awarded on the evening of the 18th of March 2014, as we've seen, was wholly contrary to Trower's advice, wasn't it? Um, no, it was working within the, the boundaries of the second part of their advice, um, so where they say that our only compliant options are to assess the tenders and award the contract to the tender, tenderer who scored the highest, based on the criteria. So that's what we were looking to do. However, if, is, but we re, we recognised if I, I would I was in a, a, a challenging position here because we had a budget, um, a budget of, uh, of one figure and a potential cost of a program at more than that. So I was in a difficult position of trying to get a board approval for that, without doing some work to actually firm up what the price actually was. So that's what we look to do, is to f establish the principle that Ryden would work with us on that. Otherwise, we'd have to go back out to tender. That would be the only route open to us. Um, Mr. Madison, let's just study, shall we, the second paragraph of the advice itself, which is in the slightly smaller type. 
in the email. The advice is, your only EU compliant options are to assess the tenders and award the contract to the tenderer who scored the highest based on your price stroke quality criteria, or not to award the contract and run a new procurement exercise. Do you accept that your discussions with Ryden were contrary to that advice? No, I don't. I think it's comp I think it's, it's, it works within the, the bounds of that com advice, and okay. we took further advice from Trowers after being through this process uh, to, a step to, to check that that was appropriate. Let, 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 well, let's look at the sentence I've just read to you. You've been given two choices. Clearly, discussions with Ryden isn't part of the second choice, which is about not awarding the contract. Are you telling us that you read the advice from Trowers to say that discussions with Ryden prior to the uh, notification that they were the winner fell within the expression tenderer who scored the highest based on your price stroke quality criteria? Yes. How could you possibly have understood that price stroke quality criteria was something which uh, had anything to do uh, with the discussions that you were having, which of course came in after their bid? So we'd had a we'd had a discussion on price. Well, there'd been a there'd been a, a, a thorough process to establish a preferred contractor through the price quality analysis, and we had a preferred bidder. Um, we were in a position where we, we, we weren't in a position to let a contract because we hadn't been through the standstill period. But um, what we, I think it's, it was it, what, we, what was clear was that we needed to establish whether the preferred bidder would be, would be amenable to working through the pre-contract, the, the terms of, that we would set out in the pre-contract agreement to establish whether or not we we could uh, go into contract with them at all. But Mr Madison, this advice is telling you that you can award the contract to the tenderer who scored the highest based on your price quality criteria. That's a reference to the formal tender, isn't it? It's clearly not a reference to offline discussions with one of the tenderers, the, is it? The, the offline discussion was established in the principle of the pre-contract agreement and the board approval. It wasn't related to negotiation of the contract sum. So, in a sense, one could say exactly the discussions you were having with Ryden had nothing to do with scoring the highest based on the price quality criteria. They were wholly outside that exercise, weren't they? No, they were in the context of that exercise. If they were in the context of that exercise, they, they would also have been offered to the other bidders to make it fair and transparent. It's and quite level. clear in Trow's advice that that isn't appropriate. Mr. Madison, I'm going to suggest to you that you knew very well what this very clear advice was telling you, and you and others at the TMO chose to do the contrary. That's, I don't agree with that. And we've, there's, a clear, there's a clear and transparent route from this advice through my board report, through the report to the executive team, and to the advice that was taken from Trowers prior to the board report that explains that is completely transparent and above board. It did have some risks attached to it, commercial risk of challenge, but that was addressed as well in the Trowers advice, the second piece of Trowers advice. If it was all transparent and completely above board, can you please explain to us why there's not a single written record of the 18th of March meeting and no reference to these discussions in, even in the letter you sent to Ryden notifying them that they were the winner. There's a clear dialogue in the emails between uh, David Gibson and uh, Stephen Blake about what exactly was going on in that, in that moment. I think it's right that you never gave any other bidder the opportunity to consider value engineering, did you? The, the, we could the, only open, the only way forward open to us here was with, through the preferred bidder Alternatively, we need to go back out to tender. Can you please answer my question? You never gave any other bidder the opportunity to consider value engineering, did you? I didn't do that because the advice from Trowers was that that wasn't a possible route through this procurement route.
And if you're going to reduce the scope or deliver a different scope or reduce the price of one of the bidders prior to the award, then it would be unfair on all the potential bidders, wouldn't it? The other bidders. Because they wouldn't have the same opportunity to talk to you about what they could do. The, the trial's advice is, is clear that the only option was to go with the preferred bidder or to go back out to tender. Well, we can see what it says. Tenderer who scored the highest based on your price quality criteria will go back out to tender. And as I put to you before, I'll put it once more, there's absolutely nothing in here which blessed your approach, which was to talk to Ryden as the lowest bidder to see if they would come down further. We didn't talk to them to establish they come down further. What we did was we proposed, um, we, we were looking to agree the principles of a pre-contract agreement, which will clarify the price, at which point our options were to either increase the budget or go back out to tender. Um, and in reality, what we did was increase the budget once those costs were clarified. Now, we've been unable to see anything in your witness statements about these pre-award discussions that you had with Ryden, uh, even in the witness statement that you provided to the inquiry in the June of this year. Why was that? To be honest, I, I couldn't... I, until very recently, I'd forgotten about this dialogue entirely. It's, um, it, it was quite difficult to remember exactly what happened at this point. Is it because you knew that these sorts of discussions were in breach of EU procurement law as advised to you by Trowers and Hamlins in the advice we've just seen? And no. that's why you wanted to keep it quiet? I wasn't trying to keep anything quiet. I'm here to give you my truth. M Mr Gibson was asked the same question as I've just asked you, and he told us that he'd been advised that it was better not to explain these discussions in a witness statement but to save it up for his oral examination. Are you in the same position as him? No, I haven't had a conversation. When did you first realise uh, that the discussions that you were having with Ryden prior to and on the 18th of March about, even as you would put it, the approach uh, were, were matters uh, which might be investigated in this inquiry? Um, I don't remember. Very recently, I think. In the last few weeks. Right. Did you not p listen to the evidence of anybody from Ryden, such as Mr. Blake, yes. in July, or read the transcript? So on the so on the back of some of the evidence that has come through the um, through the inquiry, it's, it's reminded me of this is this issue. It hadn't really occurred to me as being a significant issue at the time that I was preparing my initial statement. Right. When you answered my question at the beginning of your evidence that your witness statements represented a full and candid account. Uh, however one might characterise them, they don't represent a candid account of these discussions, do they? As I say, I, I, I didn't even remember these discussions at the time I was right, uh, working with... Do you realise, or ha have you ever realised, that as an officer of a public authority exercising public functions, you owe a duty of candour, uh, and particularly a duty of candour to this inquiry? Absolutely, and that's why I'm here. Right. And did you realise that the purposes of your giving evidence was to assist it in its, in its, uh, d in its functions? Absolutely. And do you accept that by not coming clean about these discussions in any of your statements, even as recently as June this year, or even as recently as be before you went into the witness box, you failed in that duty? I don't agree. I think that, I, 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 as I say, I didn't remember the detail of this, of this, um, uh, of this, particular, ex this particular moment. It, um, I don't have any, uh, I'm certainly not trying to withhold anything, and I think there's quite a clear, transparent um, uh, timeline and um, order trail through this that where you can see that I've reported to board and to executive team exactly what I've been doing, and I think it's, it's, it's very clear. And um, my, wit my witness statement can only cover a certain amount of information. It would be, this is, this, this project, spanned something like five years of my work experience and uh, there's an awful lot of detail in there. Mr Blake gave evidence at the end of July and uh, Mr uh, Maynard gave the f evidence for Ryden at the very beginning of September this year, uh, some nine, uh, it was eight weeks ago or so. Can you explain why even in that period of time you haven't provided a further witness statement 
giving your side of the story in relation to these discussions, but have left it up for me to ask you questions about. Um, I haven't been advised to give any further information at this stage. You haven't been advised to give any further information. I, I hadn't been. I, I haven't. I, I've been taking the advice of my, of my solicitors. Well, I don't want to know what? about what advice you've had. Can I, can I just ask you whether the existence of the Attorney General's undertaking has played any part in your thinking? Um, so I don't understand the question. Let's move on. Can we go to uh, the minutes of the TMO board meeting on the 27th of March 2014? TMO 1003-1040, please. Um, Mr. Chairman, I've just been reminded, um, it's 11.17, and it's probably an appropriate time for a break. And I am do, going to well, do, do the next topic. questions really follow up the questions you've just been putting to the witness? Well, they go on, they go to, yes, well, they do, yes. Well, that's what I thought. How long are they likely to take? Well, like they, we're going to go to, it's about 10 minutes, I suppose. Well, it might be better then to stop, yes. now, if that's convenient. Yes. Yeah. We're going to have a short break, Mr. Madison. Um, we'll come back at 25 to uh, 12, and we'll uh, resume then. And when you're out of the room, please don't talk to anyone about your evidence or anything to do with it. Thank you. All right? Thank you. We'd like to give the usher. Good. 25 to 12, please.
Yes, would you ask Mr Madison to come back in, please? All right, Mr Madison. Yes. Are you ready to carry on? Yes, Mr Millett. Yes, Mr Chairman. Um, can I ask you, please, to go to day 28, page 171, first of all? Uh, this is the evidence of Steve Blake of Ryden. And if we look at um, uh, line seven, uh, I ask him, do you recall what was discussed at that meeting? And this is a, a, the meeting of the 18th of March, 2014. Answer, not specifically. No, I don't. Question, in general? Uh, answer, went through the need to find a significant amount of savings, yeah, for the scheme to meet their budget. Do you accept that? Sorry, do I accept? You accept Mr. Blake's evidence there that at the meeting you all went through the need to find a significant amount of savings for the scheme to meet the TMA's budget. That's, I think that's his interpretation of what we were doing. What we were actually doing was establishing the principles needed for a pre contract agreement. Well, uh, m maybe nothing between us on that, but, but his words are that you went through, this is what actually happened. You went th at the meeting, you went through the need to find a significant amount of savings for the scheme to meet their budget. Did you do that? No, and he also says he didn't specifically remember the meeting, what was discussed at the meeting, so I just think that's probably an, an assumption on his part of what, he discu what right. we discussed. But I, I was very clear at that time what we were doing, which was trying to agree the terms of a pre-contract agreement uh, in accordance with the advice that we'd taken from Trous and Hamlin. Yes. I mean, you, you've... Um, pointed out in the line before that I showed you that he has no specific recollection as a comment, but I want your recollection. Do you agree or do you disagree with Mr. Blake's recollection that at the meeting, as a matter of fact, you went through the need to find a significant amount of savings for the scheme to meet the TMA's budget? So what I think he means by that is what I've described uh, earlier, is that within the contract, there were two, a couple of significant elements that hadn't been fully priced in relation to the cladding and to the windows. And also, there was an issue regarding the public realm work and the interface between the Grenfell Tower project and the Calc project, which needed to be established. Mr. So Mr. Madison, I'm going to cut you off because I wasn't asking you to interpret the transcript and give me your opinion of his evidence. What I want is something different, please which is your recollection of what actually happened at that meeting. Here we have on the page Mr. Blake's recollection, and I've, I've put it to you twice now. I'm simply asking you whether his recollection is the same as yours. Is he right or is he wrong? He's wrong. Uh, the, He's wrong. The, what, we discussed, what we discussed at that meeting was what was detailed in the dialogue between the two parties in the run-up to the meeting. The meeting was there as a backstop in case I needed any last-minute information before my board deadline. So the meeting was there as a backstop. It wasn't about negotiation. It was about being clear about the process and understanding that we were all on the same page in terms of what, in principle, uh, was the way forward. Can I ask you to go to RYD 403302, please? This is an email we've seen before. We looked at it on Thursday. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, and and uh, at um, if we look at the third one down, if we look at page one to the over the page to sorry page two over the top of the page to page three, please. I just want to look at one of the earlier emails in this run. Uh, this is David Gibson and his email uh, on the 13th of March to, uh, to Steve Blake. And it's the one in which he introduces himself. And in the uh, last two paragraphs, he says... Can you also confirm if you can make a meeting on Monday afternoon with Peter, myself, and Claire Williams, the project manager for the scheme, at our offices? And then he says, it might be useful if you can bring your estimator also. 
Now, that, that in fact did happen, wasn't it? Do you remember that Ryden did bring their estimator? I don't remember, no. no. Uh, do you remember, or can you tell us, what the purpose of David Gibson asking Ryden to bring Ryden's estimator was if, at that meeting, you were not going to discuss precise figures? I guess he, he just wanted somebody there who could discuss figures, you know, the principles of what we, that we were discussing in the, the dialogue that we'd had. But if all you were going to have was a discussion about a general approach, as you told us a number of times this morning, there would have been no point in David Gibson asking Steve Blake to bring his estimator along with that. I don't know. I don't know why David put that. I think that was probably just David's way of thinking how he would like to approach this discussion. Do you remember that Ryden did bring their estimator, a lady called Katie Bachelier, to the 18th of March meeting? I don't remember. I don't remember the meeting specifically. And this meeting wasn't set up, was it, simply to discuss general approaches? This meeting was set up to discuss particular figures in the spreadsheet David Gibson was sending uh, and Ryden's estimator's view of them in order to be able to discuss as precisely as possible what the reductions from 9.2 million could be. Now, those, those figures were, were, were to set the context of the sort of scale and the challenge that, uh, was, that was facing us and to, and so that Ryden could understand the context of that conversation. Um, if it was a negotiation of any nature, we would have had the, our quantity surveyor there. Um, so Artelia would have been invited, but this, that wasn't the purpose of this meeting. This was about establish a path through the governance of the scheme. It wasn't about the um, it wasn't about negotiation with, of the price with Ryden. Did you ever get? Did you ever ask uh, Artelia to look at David Gibson's simple spreadsheet to make sure that what he was asking for from Ryden was in line with what your with what their quantity surveyor would think? My assumption is that they put that together. In, your assumption. In, but well, you don't know that. Well, they were the quantity surveyors for the scheme. They produced the pretender estimate, and they uh, identified that the pretender estimate was greater than the budget and started a process of pulling together ideas from within the professional team as to how, um, how savings could be made to bring the scheme within budget and what those options were. So Artelia led that process, as I remember. We don't see Artelia copied in on any of the emails which arranges or which are arranged the meeting of the 18th of March or any email which sends the spreadsheet, do we? No, and that's because it wasn't a negotiation on price because I'll tell you would have to be there for that because they are managing that budget. This was a discussion about governance and how we could get an approval through our board to move the project forward. To the best of your recollection, did Artelia even know that this meeting was taking place? I think in the email we saw earlier between Jenny Jackson and Simon Cash, they made reference to an offline conversation. I think that's exactly what this was. Uh, that's a slightly oblique way of answering my question. I'll try it again. Did Artelia know that the meeting on the 18th of March was to happen? I don't know that they knew specifically there was a meeting. I think they knew there was going to be a dialogue between the client and Ryden in relation to um, a pretender, the principles of a pretender agreement that we could get through to our board for approval. You never kept Artelia in the loop with your ongoing discussions with Ryden between the 11th of March, as we've seen, and the 18th of March, did you? I don't remember. No. Um, let's go to the TMO board meeting on the 27th of March, 2014. Can we go, please, to TMO 1... 1030. And I'd like you to look, please, first of all, at that first page. This is the TMO board meeting on that day, part B. And we can see who was present there, a long list of board members. Uh, and we can see that under the list of those in attendance, you were there, weren't you? Yes. Uh, and if we turn, please, to page two. We can see that you cover the issue of Grenfell Tower refurbishment. And I'll just uh, show it to you. Uh, Peter Madison gave a progress report on the evaluation of the three tenders which had been received for this project on both price and quality. Rydens was the preferred contractor. And because there was a very tight perimeter on costs, we would work with them on the detail of their tender. 
In addition, there was some further work to be done on the planning permissions and the type of materials and cladding in order to contain costs. There would also be further work on energy, and it was hoped to attract some funding. And then it goes on. When these two pieces of work were completed, it was hoped to carry out the contract within budget. It was recommended that we enter into a pre-contract arrangement with Rydens in order to progress the project. Now, just pausing there, there's no reference there, is there, to the discussions that you've had with Ryden about even the approach, as you would put it, before the award of the contract to Ryden, or at least before they were notified that they were the winner of the tender. It doesn't specifically talk about that dialogue, but the, um, the report that was presented to the board here specifically refers to the parameters of the pre-contract agreement, which is what I was looking for to be agreed. I did certainly talk to the executive team when I presented the draft report to them about this point, and that was minutes of that meeting. So there's another meeting, is there, with the executive team, the executive. where there are minutes where you, tell, you, you talk about the pre-award discussions with Ryden. Is that right? Which, which talks about the, the offline uh, conversation to establish the principles, yes. But I think you accept what I am putting to you, which is that there's nothing here which tells the TMO board that there have been these pre-notification discussions with Ryden. That's a level of detail that I wouldn't normally put into a board report. Right. Um, let's look at the paper. Uh, that we ha that uh, you presented. It's TMO one triple zero five five eight three, please. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a document headed recommendation to note the outcome of the Grenfell Tower procurement and to agree the appointment of the preferred contractor. And you could see a big box which says purpose and item uh, 1.2 agrees to appoint Ryden Construction Limited as the preferred contractor for the project. See that? Yes. And let's just run through it. Could, before I do, can I just ask you, is this your document? Did you author this? Yes. You did. And then we have background 2.1. On 8th of January 2013, Board agreed to proceed with the procurement of the Grenfell Tower project with an agreed budget of £9.7 million. This budget has been agreed by RBKC Cabinet. And then under 2.2, you can see the proposed scope of works includes, uh, and under the second bullet point, the thermal external cladding of the building. And then if we turn the page, please, to page 2, uh, it works on down. Planning approval, 10th of January 2014, and then the project team and the project team's procurement, you see that, procured through the IESI framework. And then over the page, if you go please to um, page six, I think, having looked uh, through this, and the rest of it is detail about the tender process. If we just look quickly through that, and then we go to paragraph three, or section three at the very bottom of page six, financial implications and pre-contract activities. And then if you go to page seven, let's look at paragraph 3.2. Some further work is required to firm up the scope of scope of I'm so sorry firm up the scope of works and design and arrive at a fixed cost for the contract. Specific activities include clarify the site boundaries, detailed design, energy funding. It is recommended that the board agrees that we enter into a pre-contract agreement with Ryden up to a value of three hundred fifty thousand pounds to progress these activities in the coming weeks. When the financial implications of these activities are clear, it is recommended that the board agrees to enter into a contract with Ryden Construction Limited for the refurbishment of Grenfell Tower with a total cost of the project of £9.7 million inclusive of fees. If the final price of the contract is above £9.7 million, further approval would be required from RBKC Cabinet. If required, this would be sought in June 2014. Now, I've shown you, I think, pretty much all of this document, uh, other than the parts in the middle about the details of the tender. Um, there's nothing in there, is there, about the existence of these pre-award discussions that you'd had with Ryden? Uh, nothing mentions specifically the discussions, but the points that I'm raising there are exactly the, the things that were clarified in the pre, uh, in, in, the, in that discussion with Ryden. There's nothing in here about your decision to take a risk of challenge by the other bidders by having those discussions with Ryden, is there? Um.
I don't remember if it was covered in this report. It was covered in the. It was certainly covered in the minutes of the executive team meeting. You say that. Uh, before we leave, we'll come back to that in a moment. But but before we leave this this meeting, which is the board meeting, can we take it? We've seen both documents that neither your report nor the minute of the meeting make any suggestion, let alone state in terms that you and others at the TMO had, quotes, offline, quotes, unquotes, discussions with Ryden <coughs> prior to the award of the contract on the 18th of March about even the approach that they were going to take about price. That's right, isn't it? It doesn't cover that specific dialogue now, but I think the principles of what was written here are clear, and I've reported it to the executive team. Um, and yeah, so I think the the amount of information that's required here to make a decision is is fair, and the risk, the uh, the, the trower's advice here was that the risk was low. So if the risk was low, um, it, it didn't it didn't occur to me to, at that time to rec record that. Now, if we look at uh, item, uh, well, no, let's go back to the um, let's go back to the TMO board meeting on the twenty seventh of March. Uh, TMO one double zero three one zero four zero, please. And let's just look at item two. Again, we can see you're presenting, and underneath uh, the questions, you can see that question one at the bottom of the page uh, was it was pointed out there was a big difference in the prices being offered on page eighty three. However, Ryden's was consistently lower. You see that? Yeah. And then if we go to the top of the next page, it was queried why. You see that? It was queried why there was such a big deviation in tender prices and whether Ryden had put in a low tender in order to obtain the contract. Confirmation was given that the pre-contract period was being recommended in order to look at these issues. It was queried whether this could be interpreted as being contractually committed. However, we did not, if we did not get within budget, we would not be committed but there was confidence that it would be possible to get the contract within budget. You see that? Now that suggests, I would suggest to you, that somebody would look at the issue of price deviation in the context of Ryden's low price compared with the other bidder's prices. Was it genuinely the plan that the pre-contract period would be used to check if Ryden's price was too low to be achievable? No, that wasn't the purpose. I think that minute is is not really very accurate. What we um, the purpose of the pre-contract agreement was to give budget certainty around the material aspects of the project that were were awaiting planning permission, and so we needed to we needed to get further clarification of those. Mm. But those elements were included in the tender, so. Um, I think the, the minute take has probably confused things a little bit here. Yeah. Right. You said they were confused. I take it that you've seen these minutes before coming here today or before giving I've, I haven't looked at them since right. the time that this is missing. Okay. Taking it at face value, it rather suggests that the impression was given to the board uh, that the only discussion about bringing the Ryden winning bid number of 9.2 million down within budget was going to happen after this, after the 27th of March, doesn't it? Well, after the 27th of March, we, so at the 27th of March, we got approval to enter into a pre-contract agreement. And part of that pre-contract agreement was to firm up the price on the elements that were awaiting planning permission to progress the energy piece of work, which could bring in some additional funding, and to clarify some issues around the site boundaries, which included the works that had been priced in the Ryden's tender, but which were currently in the Calc project. And if that moved from the Calc project into the Grenfell Tower project, which they actually did, it would bring with it the budget as well. So all of these things had an impact on the, on the amount of money that was available, and that was why we needed to carry on the clarification of these points so we knew how much budget, budget there was and whether we needed any additional budget and, would, and so therefore we made the reference that we would be going back to the council, uh, the cabinet in June uh, to, to do that.
You see, there's no suggestion in this document or the presentation you made to the main board of the TMO uh, that you have already got uh, under your belt uh, some discussions or some confidence from those discussions that your budget could be met. Why is that? Sorry, I don't follow that question. Well, you see, it says in item two uh, that confirmation was given that the pre-contract period was being recommended in order to look at these issues. In other words, that was going to happen. It hadn't yet happened. And what I'm putting to you is that there's nothing in here at all which says, let alone suggests, that those discussions had already happened. There was... Sorry, I'm getting confused here because it's, this minute is confusing. <laughs> and um, so the pre-contract period wasn't looking at the base pricing of Ryden's contract, as this, as this suggests. That wasn't something we were going to do or could do. I mean, we could work with Ryden's on value engineering, um, and maybe that's what um, is being alluded to here. But the process was we were going to enter into contract with the pre-contract agreement with Ryden's. Once we've clarified the cost of the contract, we either increase the budget or we, or the option, the other option would be to go back out to tender. Look at item three. It was queried whether we had confidence in Ryden's pricing and confirmation was given that we had received a very detailed tender report which was also competitive. Did you give that confirmation? Uh, yes. I, you know? I mean, that, that, so Artelia were our quantity surveyors. They did a thorough evaluation of the, the bid that was supported by a wider evaluation by other members of my team and Artelia's team. And, um, uh, and and pricing was a key part of that and the, the evaluation of that. Do we take it from these minutes that the board expressed some concern about Ryden's price being so much lower than the other bidders? I think that the board was asking for clarification and asked some sensible questions looking at the information that was in front of them. Is that a, is that a yes to my question? I, I wouldn't say they were concerned. They asked whether... The, whether, whether whether I thought and whether the professional team thought that the price was sustainable and the advice that we'd taken from Artelia was that they felt that it was. Mm. And why, by the words Ryden's pricing, is, was that a reference to the 9.2 million uh, price in Ryden's winning tender bid? Yes. But in fact, it's right, as we've seen, that the effort until this point with Ryden was to get them to reduce their price down from the 9.2 million to 8.4 odd million. No, the action we were agreeing here was to clarify the price, because at that time their bid, their, their, their bid was 9.2 million, but we hadn't agreed key elements of the scheme that we needed to agree so that we could get cost certainty. And so that's what this report was about. We were saying these are the pieces of work we need to do to get cost certainty, at which point I can recommend to the board that we go forward on that basis. That was what this, this, this process, this, what this, this whole dialogue was about. And why is there nothing in here about agreeing the, quotes un, approach, unquotes, that Ryden might take during the pre-contract period, uh, having won the contract, uh, about bringing the price down from 9.2 million? Um. Well, it is, it is covered in that because it, the materials, the alternative material prices on the cladding, for example, were covered in the tender. So it's... Yeah. Why didn't you say, when you confirmed that you'd received a very detailed tender report, yes, not only have we got confidence in Ryden's pricing at 9.2, but we think we can get them down to much closer to our budget. Why didn't you say that? Because I didn't probably think that at the time. I was looking to work within the rules that were there. Were you concerned at the time, Mr Madison, that Ryden had put in a tender report, a tender figure that was unrealistically low? Um, I didn't. I thought there was a spread between... I mean, we didn't get a, a, a large number of, of bidders and tenders in the end. And there was a spread between first, second, and then second to third, which wasn't unusual. Um, I think it, if we asked, I mean, I, I, um, Artelia carried out an analysis and obviously recommended that uh, we go forward so they didn't flag up any specific issues. Hmm. Um, hmm. Yeah, you see, looking at item two, the question is asked, 
whether Rydens had put in a low tender in order to obtain the contract. Now, it perhaps doesn't matter who asked that question. My question to you is, did you ask yourself that question? Um, no, I took the advice from Artalia. Right. You took the advice from Artelia, but was that as a result of asking yourself that question? I didn't see anything that suggested to me that this was a, an artificially low price. But someone on the board had. Mm -hmm. Can you account for why you hadn't? I don't remember whether I had or I hadn't, to be honest. It's, it's a long time ago. And um, there would have been discussions uh, between the various parties at that time. And nobody has raised any specific concerns saying that they felt that that price was abnormally low. Mm. You see, it seems just on the face of it that the board's reaction to the tender result was that uh, Ryden's price was, as it were, too good to be true. Is that not something that occurred to you as well? I think they were asking reasonable questions about the, the pricing and giving proper scrutiny, which is their role. Can we go to TMO 00850744, please? Now, this is a minute of the 19th of March, 2014, executive team uh, and present at it are Robert Black, Yvonne Birch and Sasha Jevons, and in attendance to other people, and apologies from Anthony Parks. And it looks as if you weren't there. Is that right? I don't know. Well, uh, do you recall being at a meeting on the 19th of March, 2014? Not specifically, but... Um um, I wouldn't go to exec I wouldn't go to, to a full executive team. I would go if I had a particular report. So if there's a report here, I may have gone to present that report. Very well. Let's, um, let's look through it. Can we go to page two, just to see what's on that page? And we can see that the topics there. Fundraising tea party, councillor briefing, EGM threat, and board. Board, 27th March. Papers for the board agenda were distributed and discussed. And then if we go to the very bottom of the page, asset management strategy, Peter Madison will be discussing, and then go please to page three, the next steps with Laura Johnson, and had also discussed the process with Councillor Fielding Mellon. And then underneath that, Grenfell Tower. And we can see what's said there, and let's just see what there, there it, it said. Um, and what I want to know, first of all, is whether this is something you provided to them or whether you were present there and made this presentation. This looks like I was present and presenting my report that was going to the board the following week. So all this right. is the report that all right. um, I was finalising through the process. Let's, let's, let's look at it. Further clarification was requested on the scope of works and the preferred contractor, and this would be done. Peter Madison to brief independent board members before the meeting. The reputational importance of delivering the contract on time and within budget was recognised. The background of the report was discussed in detail. The board were being asked to agree a budget of £9.7 million and to enter into a pre-contract agreement when the detail on the cost for windows, cladding, etc. would be firmed up. We would need to strip out some of the costs which were not in the contract. Peter Madison had already met the recommended contractor informally on whether savings could be made i.e. pricing of landscape works, £200,000 saving, an alternative material for cladding, £500,000 saving, eco-funding, about £150,000, plus small-scale engineering items. With these measures, we were confident that we would get within budget, but if we could not achieve this, we would have to go back to RBKC. Although there was potential for a challenge from the other two contractors, there was a significant gap between their tenders and their recommended contractor. The situation was not unusual, and the board would be advised that further work would be done on the detail. All the tenderers had been notified of the outcome of the tender assessment on the 18th of March, and we would have 30 days before we entered into a formal contract. We may receive a, f a freedom of information request on the tender documents, which would be commercially sensitive, and this was discussed. Although we did not want to have to release the te detailed tender documents, we could release the price of the contract. There was concern that we may be required by the ICO, that's the Information um, Commissioner, I think, to release more information. Trial's advice had been taken on risks entailed in the procurement, which also included any potential freedom of information request. We wanted to have a clear line, if we can go to the next page, on how we manage any potential requests and also within the Council. 
it was queried whether it would be possible to obtain trials advice in writing. In order to avoid this potential risk, we could go back to Council on the budget. However, any change in the budget would have to go to Cabinet, which would mean a decision being deferred until July. It was proposed that we continue with the existing proposal and establish which documents we would have to release if we received a challenge, particularly since we were confident that we could get within budget. If outstanding issues could not be resolved during the pre-contract period, we would then go back to the Council on the budget and report the position to the Board. Now, did, I've read that out in full to you. Um, is that the um, record of the discussion that you recall having had on the 19th of March, as recorded here with the Executive Board? I haven't seen this. Um, so I, I wouldn't be party to the minutes of the Executive meeting, so I probably haven't seen this, didn't see this at the time, so I wouldn't be able to correct it for accuracy. But uh, it sounds like that's an, a summary of the, the conversation that I had with the Board in relation to my Board report for the 27th. Uh, and we are we to take it from this that you told Robert Black and Sasha Jevons and the other members of the executive board uh, that uh, you had had these discussions with Wrighton about specific figures, as we've seen on the previous page. page can, I see the, can I see the? Yes, go back to this, please. Yeah, third paragraph down under Grenfell Tower, landscape works. Two hundred thousand pounds, etc. I think that's a um, that isn't that isn't the um, that's the way I can see that's been minuted. But that isn't you know, the, the nature of the discussion. As I say, the discussion was to clarify the points that were written into the pre-contract agreement to clarify whether these savings could be delivered. Mm. That would be a more correct way of, of minuting it. Well. Whether it's correct or, or incorrect, do you disagree with where it says that you had already met the contract, recommended contractor informally on where the savings could be made, i.e. pricing of landscape works, £200,000 saving, an alternative material for cladding, £500,000 saving, eco-funding, about £150,000 saving, plus small-scale engineering items? So what we've... Well, can, can I just let me put the question. Do you disagree with the minute on that? Well, what what actually happened there was that so I've, I've clearly have reported that I did have the meeting with the preferred contractor, which as I, as I st stated earlier, so I've, I've been transparent about that. It wasn't a secret meeting; it was a, a meeting that I was uh, above board on, and that I clarified that there are items there that need pricing clarification. So, for example, the landscaping works, the alternative cladding material, and they were the things that we requ required clarification on, which is the tendering, um, the, the, sorry, the planning permission, which would clarify the materials that could be used and consequently the price of those. So that's actually what was being to be clarified here, so we can understand the price. It, I mean, it looks from this record that you were giving the TMO Executive Board specific figures for specific items of savings. These were items that were priced within the tender. So the landscaping works were priced within the Ryden's tender. The cladding material was, there were two options priced within the tender for cladding material. So we needed to establish through the planning process which material it would be, and then we would be able to understand what the price of that would be in the context of the Ryden tender. All of these relate to the specific pricings within their tender. And if they were already within the tender, what was the point of having an informal meeting on whether the savings could be made as listed? Because we wanted to progress that, the, the clarification of, of these issues relating to, so we want, you know, so the pre-tender pre agreement was about progressing these specific issues that were in their tender, because if the planning if, if it would, you know, the, the cladding cost was dependent on whether planning permission was for aluminium or zinc, for example. We needed to get the planning permission to know which cost applied. Um, the landscaping works was, it was an optional cost within the Rydens contract, but it was also in the Bui contract on the adjacent site. So we needed to establish whether that would move into, into the Rydens contract or remain in the Bui contract. So these were things that needed clarification, and that was the purpose of the pre-contract agreement, mm -hmm. to clarify costs which were um, priced within the Ryden's document. The other aspect of this was the 
value engineering, which was the £270,000 or so that was estimated at that time, and that was about establishing the principle with Rydens that they would work with us through the value engineering uh, facilities within that contract. This, of course, all took place on the 19th of March, didn't it, this discussion? Yes. After the award of the contract to Ryden on the 18th? After the notification went out, mm. yes. Do you recall having any discussions with any member of the executive board along the lines we see here before the contract was notified to the winner, the, the outcome of the bid was notified to the bidders on the evening of the 18th of March? Um, I don't remember. It's, I don't remember. Can we take it, therefore, that at least as a matter of record, you didn't share the, the discussions that you'd had informally with Ryden with the TMA's executive board until after Ryden had been told it was the winner of the bid? I don't remember whether I did or not. It, 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 I may have had a conversation with, um, with my line management. I can't remember. I'm going to turn to a different topic. Uh, and that's the decision-making about ACM cladding on the building. Now, scrolling back, if we can, to 2013, uh, the prospect of using a cladding other than zinc had already been raised when you came into uh, the project in early 2013. That's right. Yeah. And I think it's right that, in fact, the suggestion of using aluminium cladding had come from Leadbitter as a potential for value engineering. I saw a record of that, yes. You saw a record of that. Where did you see a record of that? I can't remember, but I certainly, in an early briefing, I think I probably got from probably Artelia. Um, I was briefed uh, that there were a variety of options um, in respect to the, uh, the cladding material. Right. Uh, <coughs> an early briefing. Well, it, 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 let's go, just to pin this point down, TMO 00879771, please, which is your notebook number one. And I'd like to go to page 10 on the right-hand side of that. Uh, and uh, if you uh, look, please, uh, at the bottom of the page, you can see... Uh, and the only date I think we have for this page uh, is on the top left-hand side, 28th of January 2013. Uh, and... Uh, you can see uh, down uh, under um, at the bottom of the page, you see uh, actions, Apple Yards to write to Leadbitter. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, and then it says uh, resources plan. And then item three, clarify market testing of costs for a D. Um, VE options for bringing scheme within budget. You see that? Yes. And then, uh, in fact, we also see uh, immediately ab above that uh, current costs against current cost plans under A. Was that a discussion about value engineering? Sorry, sorry, I'm, is what a discussion about value engineering? Well, did any of the discussions in that note refer to value engineering relating to current costs against cost plan? Well, point D is VE options for bringing scheme within budget. So that's value that's engineering, what I, mean. I yes. see. But if you cast your eye to the left-hand side of the page, and this may be earlier in a meeting, at the bottom of the page it says VM zinc cladding is proposed. Leadbitters propose aluminium as cheaper option, I think that is, but still £1 million over budget. Do you remember that discussion? I've seen this, I've said, yes, I, I do remember that discussion. There were a lot of, there were a broad, very wide number of um, materials being discussed at various points, but yes, I do remember right. that Betters had proposed an aluminium option. Right. And what did you understand aluminium cladding to refer to when you wrote that note? I didn't, other than th they were described as zinc or aluminium. I see. W when aluminium cladding was referred to as an alternative, did you understand that that was a cheaper option than zinc? It's clear f 
from that that there was cheaper but still over yeah. still over budget, still expensive. Right. So I mean, I think you're really just confirming your your note was accurate at the time. Mm -hmm. um, now the bidders in the tender, when we look at it a year later, uh, were all asked to price several options for cladding, including an alternative for ACM. Do you remember that? I don't specifically know. You don't. D did you have any input uh, as um, as the client uh, in into the NBS specification, which went out to tenderers? No. You didn't? Not personally. I mean, the client, my team, <coughs> I had a head of service and a project manager who were leading the, the, the operational aspects of this, and they managed the, uh, the team. Did so, you? So. I'm sorry, I cut off. No, Did you know that as part of the NBS specification, bidders had been asked to price uh, alternative rain screen cladding um, as well as zinc? I did. You did. Yes. You did. <coughs> it's that, the reason for that was at that stage we didn't have planning permission, and the planning permission had been quite contentious to that point. So it had been through a number of iterations of planning, and there'd been a long dialogue. So what we wanted to do, because the decision hadn't been made at that time, was to price a number of options so that we could then, once planning permission was achieved, have a firm price from a contractor. What we didn't want was to select a contractor, then get a planning permission that moved the, the material costs, and we'd end up in a weak position in a negotiation on an alternative material. Now, it's right in the end that Ryden offered the lowest cladding price of the bidders as well as the largest saving to be made if a CM was, was chosen. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And can we go back to um, Artelia's final tender report of the 12th of March 2014, which is at ART 402197. And I'd like to go to page 12 at the bottom of the page there. As so we can see the adjusted tender sum there compared, and we can see that Artelia's pre-tender estimate was 10 million odd pounds, just over 10 million pounds, and Ryden comes in at 9.249 million, Durkan at 9.940 million, and Mullally comes in at 10.480 million. You see that? Yes. And it's clear that all of those bids were over your budget of 8.5 million, weren't they? Or 8.415 yes. million for construction. Is it fair to say that from at that point on, <coughs> at least, 12th of March 2014, the general focus had to be on the savings that could be achieved in order to bring the costs down to somewhere near the TMO's then budget? It wasn't just a focus on savings, it was a focus on cost clarity. So, you know, if, if the planning permission had been for a different material, for example, um, then our options are to increase the budget or to do, diff you know, or to do something different in terms of the procurement. Right. But do you agree that the natural consequence of what you were doing at the time was looking for ways to reduce the cost of the project? It was looking for the options as to whether the... the, the this, the same sort of outcomes of the scheme could be delivered uh, within that budget or whether we needed to increase the budget significantly or rethink the whole project. Uh, and as one of those options, the TMO was searching for the cheapest possible cladding? No. Um, the, I mean, there, were, there are cheaper options. There's, there are, there's a vast range of different approaches that could um, uh, be applied to the cladding materials used on the building. And there had been a long conversation with uh, planners on this whatever so there, there had been a very wide number of iterations and options uh, proposed in different materials um, by the architects <coughs> um, but I think the the key thing that from a client perspective was that our understanding was that anything that is being proposed as a material is compliant with um, building regulations and, um, and and that was part of their contractual obligation as well as their professional obligation. Well, well again, Mr. Madison, forgive me for pointing this out, but the answer you've given me deviates into a whole lot of different topics, and I'm not going to follow each of those up with you. My question was, is it right uh, that at the time, as part of its exercise in March 2014, was that the TMO was looking for the cheapest cladding it, it could get in order to reduce the overall budget? I don't agree with the word cheapest. Right, was looking at not, it was, we were looking for a compliant um, material, something that, and it, it, we weren't looking for the cheapest, we were looking for something that would achieve planning permission and that would meet the regulation. Uh, well, but zinc did that, didn't it? I don't know. 
uh, and that a change to ACM was for budgetary reasons. No, it was an option in the tender. Yes. So, but, the, so our architects, the architect here, had proposed a range of different options, and all of which were required to be compliant by them professionally and, and contractually and legally. Um, so we were given options around that, and some of those options were um, were aesthetic, um, and we needed to go through a process of agreeing with the planners which ones w w we could install. Well, let's look at it very broadly. Why do you think aluminium composite material rain screen panels were being discussed at all? They'd been proposed as an option by the architect. Why? Because uh, on the assumption that they were compliant and that they were an appropriate material to be used on the building. But the main or primary uh, specification for the rain screen panels was zinc with a honeycomb metal core. What did you think the purpose of the alternative ACM uh, um, quote was? It was for two, two reasons. One, one was about planning, because we didn't have planning approvals, and there'd been a long conversation with the planners about the, the aesthetics of the building and how it should work. And the second is for, it was a, was a price marker, so that if and when the planning permission is approved, then you've got a, a price for that material that, that would save any negotiation down the line. So are you saying that it was your understanding that the reason why the NBS specification carried an alternative for, for, to zinc, namely ACM, was not for budgetary reasons? Is that what you're telling? It was for pricing purposes, and it was to give an option yeah. as and when planning was approved. Yeah. And at, coming back then to this time, which is March 2014, the NBS specification having gone out as part of the tender in the previous November, it's right, isn't it, that the TMO was looking at cladding in particular as one of the candidates for, let me put it this way, value engineering. This was, um, it was one of the options that were proposed by our, our professional team as an option. So all of the design and the technical aspects of, of the cladding selection was proposed and recommended by our professional team. So that was um, Studio E as the designer, Artelia as our quant quantity surveyor and employer's agent. So they were the ones who were considering these and they were recommending things that we could consider in terms of... Um, budget options going forward. Mr. Mr. Madison, I, it's, a, it's a long and very qualified answer to a very simple question. Was the TAMO interested in looking at ACM as one of the elements of value engineering? That's what was recommended by our, our professional team, yes. So I think the word at the end of that is yes is to, my, uh, to my question. But it wasn't driven by the TMO. Was, we were taking advice here on the, from the professional team who are responsible for the design and the cost control of the project. Now, I'd want to examine the role of RBKC in all of this. And you're, you're, I, think, uh, I, th I think the effect of your advice last week, sorry, your evidence last week, was that RBKC would effectively be in control of the budget as the funder. Um, no, not entirely. The, 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 so, I mean, I think this project in particular was complicated, so there was governance of it through the board, and there was also governance of it through cabinet, uh, because some of the money that was uh, put into the project came from a different source. Right. So I treated both lines of governance as the same, really, and looked for approval through both. Right. Well, let's go to a document then. TMO 1000-2849, please. Um, this is a report to the TMO Programme Board on the 20th of June 2013. Uh, and uh, just for your own chronolo chronology, this was a day after the arrival of the final updated June, two, June 2013 Artelia report, which we looked at last week. Now, if we go to the bottom of the first page, you can see... Um, that there is discussion uh, of the proposed scope of the works. Do you see that? Yes. And immediately above that, it says, following a discussion with the Director of Housing at RBKC, options to reduce the scope of the works to the Boxing Club and Nursery have been rejected. 
However, the proposals to create additional workspaces in the baseline studios have been omitted from the proposals. The director also indicated that the scheme should be contained within the £9.768 million budget. See that? Yes. And who is the uh, director of housing referred to there? That's Laura Johnson. That is Laura Johnson. Now, the figure there is the budget. Is this right? Inclusive of costs and professional fees? Yes. Yeah. So when, when we look at the 9.768, just to be clear, we, we're, we're really talking about that figure inclusive of fees with a construction budget of 8.4-odd million pounds. Yes. Uh, and we know, I think, and just correct me if I'm wrong about this, that the overall budget, fees inclusive, was increased in June 2014 to 10.3 million pounds. That's right. Yeah. But as at this time, June 2013, it looks like the TMO is operating on the assumption uh, that it could have no more money for this project, uh, over and above the 9.7. Yeah, we were looking to work to that budget at that time, yes. Mm. So you were working, yes, exactly. You were working, looking to work to that budget. Um, did that mean that if in the tender the prices came in higher than that budget, the TMO wouldn't simply be able to go to RBKC and say, well, can we please have some more money? The professional team at this time was trying to work within that budget, so we were looking to engineer the scheme into that. When you say at this time, which time are you referring to? In that at the answer? time of this discussion. Uh, I I indeed. Uh, but then there was a retender, and my question again, did the fact that you were uh, um, told by Laura Johnson uh, that the scheme should be contained within the £9.768 million pound budget mean that when the tender came in and the lowest price was higher than the budget, you wouldn't simply be able to go back to RBKC and ask for more money? It wasn't as categorical as that, but I think that, um, that you know, there was a significant budget here. This is £10 million, pounds, been, you know, nearly £85,000 a unit, um, in, in a block, which and the ten nine point seven million pounds was was more than the entire budget for the capital expenditure on the rest of the borough that year. So it was a really significant amount of work, and I think Laura was saying, you know, try and work you know, work within within that confine. It's a lot of money. Yes, uh, and really, it comes to this. Having been told that in the June of two thousand and thirteen, when it came to March two thousand and fourteen. Was it impossible for you, effectively, to go to RBKC and say, our budget is £800,000 short of the lowest bidder, can we please increase our budget? It wouldn't have been impossible. We could, we could have done that. Why didn't you? Because we felt that there was, an, it, there was, a, step, there was a, a step to go through first to establish what, um, what, what the, the price of the, of the works actually is in terms of clarifying... Uh, the issues that I've, I've, I've talked about in terms of we didn't have planning permission. We need to talk about the, you know, the, the you know, what the appropriate materials were, getting planning permission for the windows, etc. Why, instead of taking a risk of a non-compliant tender process and calculating that risk and deciding it was worth running, didn't you simply, as a first step, go to RBKC and say? Can we please have £800,000 more? Because we still didn't know the cost of the project. It was an academic point. that We needed to understand the cost of the project, and to do that, we needed, to get plan we needed the contractor to get planning permission, and, um, and we needed to clarify the other issues that I've mentioned in the pre-contract agreement. When you say you didn't understand the cost of the project, are you telling us that when Ryden said £9.2 million, you thought they meant something else? No, I'm saying that we didn't have planning permission. There was still risk attached to that price because we didn't know which material was going to be, was going to be required. Why didn't you go, as a first step, to Laura Johnson and say, the bids have come in at minimum £800,000 above our budget. It's very likely that I'm going to have to ask for a significant amount more money. Why didn't you do that? Because we didn't think that was the case. We thought what you, what we, the, the, the first step in that was to go and clarify exactly the, the issues that were unclear, which were about the material cost, the window design, the issue around the public realm around the building. So we went and clarified those costs, at which point we were able to go back to the council with 
a more informed proposal because these things have now been developed and agreed and at that point they increased the budget to 10.3 million. Right. It's really this. Why, did, why was your first reaction to take a risk of a non-compliant EU procurement exercise rather than simply going to RBKC and, and asking them for more money, even if the sum wasn't exact? I just didn't see it that way. I thought that, that uh, mine seemed a logical approach to clarify the costs and then, then to get whatever approval that would, be, that would require. And is that because actually the very last thing you could do was ask RBKC for any more money? No, the RBKC had been very... They were, they were in a process of releasing additional capital expenditure. So at that time, we'd... Uh, so the capital programme, when I arrived at the, at the CMO, was about eight, seven or eight million pounds. That had increased to about 22 million pounds a year. So they were, they were releasing capital investment to invest in the, in the housing stock at that time. And Grenfell Tower was a significant part of, the, of an early stage of one of those projects. Let's move then to the detail of the discussions with Ryden on the 18th of March. I've already shown you some of the, uh, some of the documents about that and the presence of Katie Bachelier there. Um, let's look at RYD 403489 then, please. I want to look at some of the detailed figures. This is an email from Katie Bachelier on the 20th of March 2014 to Simon Lawrence and Steve Blake. Um, now, you're not copied in on this. It's an internal Ryden communication. And she says, all further to our meeting on Tuesday, please find attached our summary list of value engineering options. As discussed, we will continue to look for further savings and identify them as we progress. Now, this is the 20th of March, and that's during the OJEU standstill period, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and... Um, uh, I'm so sorry. I've got this. I've got this wrong. It's, it isn't an internal email at all. It's an email to you, Mr. Madison, uh, and indeed to Mr. Gibson as well. Uh, so you did see this at the time. I'm sorry. I put this to you on a wrong basis. In fact, you received this at the time, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she's sending you a list of value engineering options. Did you open the document? Do you think? I don't remember. It says further to our meeting on Tuesday, and that would be the meeting on the 18th of March, would it? I assume so, yeah. And Katie Bachelier was, as I think we've established, Ryden's estimator present at the meeting. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and she says, please find attached our summary list of value engineering options. Uh, and you can see that there are two attachments to the email. There's the VE options 18th of March document and the cladding VE options 18th of March 2014 document, you see? Yes. Uh, do you remember whether Katie Bachelier was asked to produce specific figures or revised figures for savings at the actual meeting on the 18th of March? No. Uh, can we look at the documents? First, can we go to RYD 403491? This is the second of the two documents, or the second of the documents attached to her email. It's Grenfell Tower Value Engineering Cladding Options. Do you see? Yes. And you can see that she sets out uh, cladding options for an alternative zinc system cassette uh, and face fixed and an alternative aluminium system for cassette and face fixed. And there are the f uh, savings in negative. Do you see? Yes. Um, did you open the attachment when she sent it to you? I don't recall. Do you, do you remember seeing this document at the time? I don't recall. Did you have any understanding by what she meant by alternative zinc system cassette? No. Or face fixed. Oh, well, I know what face fixed and cassette mean, but I don't remember this particular document. Right. Uh, did you do you remember the figures for alternative aluminium system cassette of two nine three saving and an alternative aluminium system face fix of three seven six saving? I don't remember this specific uh, piece of information at that time. Do you remember, in general terms, being uh, told that cassette was more expensive than face fixed in either system? Not necessarily at this time, but I remember a conversation at the time when um, uh, you know, subsequently there was a conversation with... Right. Do you remember getting the impression at the time from the email that the cheapest cladding on this assessment was face-fixed ACM? I don't remember at that time. I mean, this, wasn't a, this was a level of detail that we didn't require information on at the moment because this would have been a matter for the professional team, but clearly Ryden had been doing some work 
um, as part of their evaluation and decided to share it with us early. Did, they, did Katie Bachelier share these figures or anything like them with you at the 18th of March meeting? Not that I remember. Just while we're on the document, can I just ask you to note the two aluminium figures at the bottom two rows there? The aluminium cassette as the alternative case of uh, saving of 293 odd thousand pounds, and for face fixed, the saving of 376 odd thousand pounds. Just note that. We'll come back to that. Can we move on then in time to the 1st of April 2014, some 10 days or say later, 11 days later? Um, now, we know that. Uh, uh, Ryden had been notified of the fact that they were the winners on the 18th of March, just for date purposes. Can we look at TMO 1002253, please? Uh, this is a minute of the 1st of April contractors' induction meeting at KCTMO's offices. You see that? And... Yes. Although this issue is a draft, it's the one we've been using, and uh, nobody seems to suggest this is inaccurate in any way, uh, except in relation to specific matters, perhaps. You were at this meeting, I think, if you can see the list of those present. Yes. If we go to page two at item 2.1, please, you can see that the note says, under the heading Proposed Savings Referenced in Tender Submission, it says there is a potential saving of up to £376,175 that could be realised through changes to the proposed cladding. Savings can be achieved by changing the material and the me method of fixing. Changing from zinc to aluminium and using a face fixing rather than cassette would save the most money. All changes would have to be approved by the planners. SL, that's Simon Lawrence, who was also at the meeting, noted that the only noticeable difference in appearance is that you would be able to see some of the fixings if the cladding is fixed using a face fix. Now, I just want to ask you about the figure of £376,175 there. That's the figure in Katie Bachelier's um, document that we saw she sent you on the 20th of March, isn't it? Yes, I can see that. Yes. And that was the highest possible saving that could be made on cladding, wasn't it? As we've seen from her list. Uh, from her? <coughs> yes, from her list, yes. Yeah. Um, do you know who said at the meeting there is a potential saving of up to £376,175. I can't remember. Is it, is it fair to say that at that stage the, the TMO wanted to have face-fixed aluminium cladding because it could get the largest possible saving that way? Um, I think our view was we needed to clarify what, pl what, what would satisfy the planners at this stage. So... Yes, it, it's clear that all changes would have to be approved by the planners, mm -hmm. but I'm interested in the, in the money side of things. Is it the case that the TMO uh, w wanted or would have liked to have ACM face-fixed as the system because that would produce the most savings? Um, I think it's more complex than what the TMO wanted. I think we wanted something that was, you know, our, our understanding was that all of these materials were compliant and that the planners needed to be satisfied that they were appropriate. So we, um, so those that issues were, were more important than the price it, itself, although there was a consideration, consideration of um, the, ch you know, the choice between a zinc system and an aluminium system mm. was really about, um, you know, under, was based on an understanding that they had similar outputs, they had similar um, co uh, comp level of compliance. The topic here, though, is savings, isn't it? That's what the heading says, proposed savings. It's savings subject to, um, you know, the, it's not just savings, it's, um, you know, there, are, there are other aspects hmm. as well. Well, the topic under discussion wasn't how do we satisfy the planners, it was, well, it was what are the savings? Part. So that was part of the dialogue with the planners to try and establish exactly what materials would satisfy them and that would clarify what the appropriate cost would be. I'm sorry, let me try again. The topic under discussion was the proposed savings, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. And the entirety of the first paragraph is about what savings could be achieved by changing from, from zinc to ACM, yes? Yes. And you've got a specific figure for the maximum saving there, which was face-fixed ACM. That was the topic of conversation, no? It looks like that, yes. Yes. 
and of course, although it says all changes would have to be approved by the planners, the focus here was the maximum saving that the TMO could achieve by changing from zinc to ACM. Is that not the case? But there's an un and with an underlying assumption that those will meet with regulations and with planning. Did you question whether there would be a reduction in quality or performance when c considering the substitution of the zinc panels with ACM panels? Did I personally? Yes. Um, I don't remember having a specific conversation on that. The assumption here is that all materials that are proposed by the designers comply with building regs and the law. Now, it's right, isn't it, that from this time on, the project team never considered any type of cladding other than ACM? I don't recall. I wasn't involved in all of the discussions. Right. Was there any dis question or discussion about which type and which manufacturer of ACM would be used? I don't recall. I mean, for example, do you remember a discussion about whether it should be uh, Rainer Bond made by Arconic uh, or Aluco Bond made by 3A? I wasn't familiar with those at that time. Do you know? Uh, you say. Do you, do you know why only Rainer Bond ACM was being considered? As seems to be the case. I didn't know. Now, a saving of three hundred and seventy-six thousand odd pounds is a pretty big saving, isn't it? If you can make it. Yes. Yeah. Did you ever ask how come it's so much cheaper than zinc? How come ACM is so much cheaper than zinc? I wasn't deeply involved in the conversations at the, at the team. That was, that was really run by my team, and I had more of an overview. And my, my role in this was about the governance side of things, the budget, um, and making sure that uh, high-level stakeholder involvement, really. I see. And, and it would follow from that answer that you would personally never have had cause to consider whether the ACM alternative was acceptable or compliant from a fire safety perspective. I wouldn't be involved in that sort of de detailed level of conversation now. Did you ever ask the question itself whether when going about value engineering specifically in relation to the cladding, there might be a compromise to its or of its functionality or safety. And that, it, that, that just wasn't allowed in terms of the, the, the process. So anything has, any alternative materials has to meet regulations. Yeah. Now, you've mentioned planning quite a lot in your evidence this morning. I just want to examine that a little bit more closely, if I may, with you. Uh, the Planning Commission, I think, was granted on the 10th of January 2014, wasn't it? Subject to conditions. Yes. Yeah. Can we look at the decision notice? It's TMO 00831107. And on the, the first page, we can see the date, 10th of January 2014, and the heading, uh, and then the subheading, Permission for Development, brackets, conditional brackets. And it then says, the Borough Council hereby permits the development referred to in the undermentioned schedule, subject to the conditions set out therein, and in accordance with the plans submitted, save insofar as may otherwise be required by those plans or by the said conditions, your attention is drawn to the enclosed information sheet. Uh, just looking at the document, do you remember seeing this at the time? No. You didn't. Um, can we look at page two, please, of this document? And let's look at conditions three and four. Condition three is detailed drawings or samples of materials as appropriate in respect of the following shall be submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority before the relevant part of the work is begun and the work shall not be carried out other than in accordance with the details so approved and shall thereafter be so maintained. And then here's the condition. Materials to be used on the external faces of the buildings. And then, under item four, the same condition in respect of the windows and the doors. And the reason in, 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 uh, in relation to the materials is to accord with the development plan by ensuring that the character and appearance of the area are preserved and living conditions of those living near the development suitably protected. And in relation to windows and doors, 
again, to ensure the appearance of the development is satisfactory and to safeguard the immunity of the area. And we can see that. Um, does that tell us, in relation to Condition 3, that external cladding material was still to be approved by planning? Yes. And to put that in the context within the timeline of the OJEU tender, it, it, does this mean that the... Um, that, that um, the effect of achieving planning permission with this condition in it means meant that the contract could be awarded without a final specification as to the cladding. In other words, the cladding could be specified after the contract was awarded. The responsibility post-contract passed to the main contractor as the designer to comply with the, the planning permission. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, to put it a slightly different way, during the OJEU, OJEU process, up to the award of the bidder, award of the successful contract of the bidder, uh, it was still an open question as to what the planners would accept by way of the cladding material. That's right. And therefore it left it open for discussion, if you like, or decision at a later stage. Yes. Yes. Uh, and and if, if Ryden were the winners, as they turned out to be, that would mean that the cladding itself could be chosen by them at a later stage in the process. I don't know the details of how that was written in the, in the tender, but um, that was my understanding. Yes, and the fact that the planning wasn't fixed in respect of a particular cladding material m meant that um, a cheaper cladding system than, one in, than the primary zinc in the NBS specification uh, could be selected and put to planners um, it could be, although the ACM was it was also priced within the specification. Yes, I know, absolutely. Okay. But, but in other words, you had a lot of optionality, if I can use that word, about what uh, uh, cladding you would use, given the state of the planning consensus at the time. Yes. Yeah. Now, can we go to TMO 00851142? Uh, this is an email uh, from you to David Gibson, I'm sorry, uh, from Claire Williams to, to David Gibson, copying you in on the 6th of May 2014, uh, and it forwards an email from Simon Lawrence of the same day. Do you see that? Yes. Um, do you remember this email? No. Now, let's have the first and the second pages of this up together, because we, I just want to look at the Simon Lawrence email with you, because clearly you were copied in on it, or it was forwarded to you. And uh, it says, um, afternoon all, due to a pre-booked training course that I have, I will not be able to attend Thursday's meeting with the RBKC planners. However, fortunately, Steve Blake, my director, has offered his services to attend on my behalf. I'll bring Steve up to date with all the information that I currently have. Just to clarify my understanding of the meeting agenda and goals, I've listed them below. Agenda points. And if you look at the agenda points, it says under the first one, or first bullet, proposal of material change to the facade from zinc to aluminium composite ACM, put forward our case that ACM is not an inferior product to zinc. Do, do, you, do you remember reading Simon Lawrence's email at the time with these agenda points in it? Um, I don't recall, but... Was there a concern, do you remember, that the planners might think that ACM was an inferior product to the zinc? Um, well, Simon Lawrence is suggesting here <coughs> that it's not. Indeed. Uh, and he's suggesting that it's not as part of a case. And a case um, is obviously a position. My question is, was there a concern within the TMO uh, that the planners thought, more might think, that ACM was an inferior product to zinc? I don't know. I think we were just trying to... I think that the, the whole project team was trying to arrive at a design and a set of materials that met the planning, was planning permission. Y yes, I, 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 absolutely. Uh, my question, again, do you remember whether there was a concern, a worry, uh, that the planners might think that ACM was inferior to zinc? I don't know. And, and, uh, and did you think that it was necessary for Ryden to argue a case or put forward a case that ACM wasn't inferior to zinc? I don't know. I don't know the purpose of Simon's right. email here. 
Well, you see, you, you received this email, I know in copy, but you received this email from Claire Williams, who thought it was important enough to ensure that you were copied in on it. Uh, what was your role at the time in relation to this detailed matter, if not at least to understand what was going on? Well, at this stage, um, Rydens had been appointed and were working on the details of the pre-contract agreement. Um, so it was for them to work up a, a design that was um, that, that would meet approval. Uh, that was what they were doing here. Is it, is it fair to say that at least Ryden and, and, and you, Ryden and the TMO, were aware that the planners needed in some way to be convinced that ACM was a suitable material for the building in place of zinc? I think this was... I think that the conversation with the cladding, as is, 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 is I remember, was all about the aesthetics. And so it was about... Um, and there had been various iterations of various designs over a very long period of time. And now we had a main contractor in place, and they were taking that forward to get the approval that was needed, and that would unlock the whole issue about how much it was going to cost. What did you think Simon Lawrence meant by putting forward our case that ACM is not an inferior product to zinc? What case was he talking about, did you think? I think our case is Ryden's case. And what case did you think Ryden was, was putting? that ACM is not an inferior product to zinc. And why do you think they needed or were having to put such a case? I don't know. I think this was this was, appears to be Simon trying to talk to a, a team that he's not been part of and agree a set of principles ahead of a meeting. So I think he's just trying to set, the, set an agenda here, really. Mm. Can we then look at the first page of this uh, email run, which is the email that Claire Williams sends to David Gibson, copied to you uh, on the same afternoon... David, our session with the planners re the cladding is this Thursday. Simon Lawrence of Ryden has just sent through the briefing below. And I note in the final paragraph his comment, re the planning discharge eight weeks on being the only point at which you can get certainty on the cladding costs. And then, and then she says, I think we will have to take a view based on our response on Thursday and perhaps get Laura to bring pressure to bear to see if we can get some reassurance prior to the final approval. Otherwise, our contract sum will be hanging out until the early July, potentially. Uh, the Laura to which Claire Williams is referring there, was that Laura Johnson? I assume so. Did you understand so at the time? Yes. Yeah. Would Laura Johnson be able to bring pressure to bear, using Claire Williams' words, uh, to the RBKC planning department? I think the relevant words there are, I guess, some reassurance. So I think um, it sounds like we're, we've been in a dialogue with planners for a long time. We're looking for some certainty around certain aspects of the design and the scope of works so we can move things on and it's Claire's concern here is that there's a potential eight week or there's been there's been eight week dialogue so far and um, we need some clarity otherwise we're uncertain about the costs and the way forward well mr madison i didn't ask you about what you thought the relevant words were I was asking you about the other words. Get Laura to bring pressure to bear. So can you please answer my question? I'll ask it again. Would Laura Johnson be able to bring pressure to bear on the RBKC's planning department? I think Laura would be able to get some reassurance on certain issues. So I don't think it would necessarily mean pressure. She would need, she'd be able to talk to relevant people there and get some clarity about how they were thinking if there was a bit of an impasse between the TMO or with Rydens and uh, the planners. Well, I'm just asking you about the expression, get Laura to bring pressure to bear. I just want you to address that with me, please. I, very I, they're Claire's words. I can't really the, respond Let me to ask them. the question. They're Claire Williams's words. Oh, you're right. Um, she clearly thought that it was possible for Laura Johnson to bring pressure to bear. Now, would you agree with me that it would be entirely inappropriate for Laura Johnson to bring pressure to bear on the RBKC planning department? Um, I think if it's to give somebody a nudge to make something happen, I don't see what pre why that is inappropriate. Well, that wasn't the wording that Claire Williams used and making all allowances for her use of language from time to time. She says, perhaps get Laura to bring pressure to bear. And my question is, would you agree with me that it would be inappropriate for Laura Johnson to 
bring pressure to bear or even be asked to do so in the way which is set out here? Uh, I, I don't understand what's being set out here, so I can't really comment. But I think my interpretation of this is that Claire is trying to um, see if there's any way that we can move things on within the planning department. It, it sounds like there's been a bit of a mm. hold up there. That's how I interpret it. Right. So I take it at the time when you saw these words in Claire Williams's email in, to David Gibson, you didn't think, gosh, I can't ask Laura Johnson, or we can't ask Laura Johnson to bring pressure to bear on, on her own planning department. So I take it that you, that wasn't your reaction? I can't remember my reaction. I can't remember this email specifically. Did you tell Claire Williams or suggest to Claire Williams, perhaps, uh, that she ought to get Laura to bring pressure to bear on RBKC's planning department? I think that, um, I think when I read this, I, I, I would have probably thought, well, let's have the meeting with the planners and see where we are. So it didn't strike you that Claire Williams was suggesting something improper? No. No. Now, the emails that we've been looking at <coughs> were in preparation for a meeting on the Thursday, and the Thursday was the 8th of May, 2014. Uh, can we look at the minutes of that meeting? This is at TMO 00833991. Now, you're uh, not, I think, recorded as being present at that meeting, took place at RBKC's town hall, and you're, you're not there, as we can see. Claire Williams is there. Do you see? She's the only representative of the KTTMO there. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, you do say in your first witness statement that you saw these minutes. And just to remind you of the reference, that's paragraph 192 at page 37. I don't think there's a need to go back to it, but can we take it that that's correct? You saw these minutes at the time. Um... I may have done that. Yeah. Well, we, let, let, let's put it out, out of doubt. Um, first witness statement, please. TMO 50892 at page 37. Paragraph 192. Uh, you say, uh, after the reference to the, to the minutes, you say, which I did not attend, but I saw the minutes recorded that a flat panel ACM has proposed as the cladding material. So. So it looks from your first statement that you did see these minutes. Yeah. Yes? Can we then go back to the minutes, please? Uh, there they are. Okay, let's look at uh, the first page at item 1.2. And this is under the heading 1, material to facade. And you can see under 1.2, a flat panel ACM, aluminium composite material, was proposed as the cladding material. It was confirmed that the lifespan for this product is similar to that of the product previously suggested. See that? Yes. Uh, and uh, on the second page at item 1.4, you can see that it records that SS, that's Sarah Scannell, and uh, EG, I think that's Edward George, were presented with a number of different colour options for the ACM. SS to check how they look outside and confirm RBKC's preference to all by 16th of May 2014. And then there's a list of samples underneath that. Can you see? There are five samples. See that? Yes. Now, did you know at the time when you read this minute that those were all ACM? No. You didn't. It, did you know at the time in general terms that at least from this point on, if not earlier, the building was going to be covered in aluminium composite material and no. nothing else? Um, all that remains. Sorry, I'll, I'll let you answer the question. I don't know, but I think that it's clear here that um, it's been proposed to the planners, and um, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that although questions of colour and questions of fixing method remained outstanding, as they did, there was no question from this point on, if not from earlier, uh, that the rain screen material would be ACM. I think once, the, once it was established with planning that that was acceptable to them. Yes. Mr Chairman, it's one o'clock, and this is, I think, an appropriate moment for a, a break. Right. Thank you very much. Yes. <clears throat> well, Mr. Madison, we're going to have a break now so that everyone can get some lunch. We'll come back and resume at two o'clock, please. In the meantime, please don't talk to anyone about your evidence or anything okay. to do with it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Two o'clock, please. <clears throat>